All right, hey, welcome to the first. Uh, we're going to have our official welcome come soon, but I'm just going to give some logistics. But welcome to the first event of the uh, Planet Positive 2030 initiative that is sponsored by the IEEE Standards Association. We want to say thank you to all of our web uh, attendees. Let's give it up for the live stream attendees. I have like 14 friends in India, like, could you change the times? <laughs> change. So thank you for joining, or Australia. Seriously, thank you for joining. Um, want to mention a couple of things. I have my mask off because I'm on stage and there's no one near me, as you all know. Sorry for this annoying reminder, but uh, we do recommend you wear your masks. Uh, that is something both from IEEE and Stanford. Up to you, uh, your comfort level on that. Thank you for testing. Want to mention this, I've forgotten, I'll be thanking her again in a minute, but Vanessa reminded me, these name tags, you can plant these name tags. These are not just recyclable, you can plant these guys. And you will grow any number of different trees, which is really, really cool. So um, we also wanted to mention in terms of COVID and safety, we do recommend when you're eating to stay outside. So basically all the measures you may normally be taking, but we really just want to make sure you're safe. Okay, so let's see. I have a couple other things to say here. Um, okay, uh, who here knows what a land acknowledgement is? Please raise your hand if you do. Okay, and thank you if you do. Um, there's a woman who can't be here today, and if she's watching, we want to give a special thank you and shout out to Mila Aliana, who's on our leadership team. We call her our chief weaver. Um, she is deeply knowledgeable in indigenous traditions. And in terms of land acknowledgements, uh, my, my interpretation of them, if I say this wrong, forgive me, Mila, and thank you so much for all the work that you've done. She's in London and couldn't join us today because of travel stuff, um, is to basically connect you to land and ancestors while also honoring the, the first people who were here. So I'm gonna start off by reading the Stanford Land Acknowledgement. We recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to native people, to native peoples. And I hope also that I pronounced Ohlone people correctly. Uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do is, if you're comfortable, uh, close your eyes, if you would, for a moment as we start off this event. And in terms of a land acknowledgement kind of mindset, I'd like you to picture a child in your life. Maybe it's one of your own kids. Maybe it's someone you know. Maybe it's a picture of a child you've seen across the world and their face was arresting and beautiful. If you're comfortable, keep your eyes closed while you picture that person. What I want you to do is think of the work that we're doing in the next two days. That work is for them. And in two days, I'll do this exercise as we close. And what I want you to be able to picture is that child saying, Thank you. Thank you for remembering to connect to me and to land in general. And with that, please open your eyes. And someone is literally calling me right now. Okay. <laughs> One of our volunteers. I will tease him later. Um, okay, let me see this. I want to do a couple of thank yous, as I mentioned. First of all, I want to say thank you to the crew and to all the wonderful people who helped check us in today at Stanford. Let's give it up for the crew. Also, the microphone person is named Mike, so I just have to say that that is purely, that's just extraordinary, and if someone, you know, checks me in and their name is Badge, well done, Stanford, so I was going to say that. Um, also want to say, um, and they will be speaking later, a thank you to uh, Gabrielle, and two, I'm gonna do my, I wrote this down so I can get it correctly, I'm so sorry, I sometimes forget how to pronounce people's names, Agnieszka, and forgive me, Agnieszka Pilot. Um, the art that you're gonna see on screen, and as you checked in, the beautiful statues, both the miniature statues of, with the COVID tests and the moss-covered statue, get excited because later we'll have presentations from Gabrielle and Agnieszka, uh, and my, 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 my loose interpretation is how to connect you with, with art 
uh, in, in such a way that, and connect you to your values, that the work you're doing here today can be that much more visceral and, and uh, uh, something that connects you to the art. And I probably said that badly, but the point is, we're showing their, their work on screen, and, and that'll be happening throughout the conference. I want to give a huge thank out. If, if you are a chair or a moderator or a scribe, could you please stand up really quickly? If you're a chair who helped create strong sustainability by design. I just want to give a round of applause to these folks. Um, they are the people who put together strong sustainability by design, the 250 page plus document that you received. And uh, anyone who's online listening, thank you. You made this work happen. There'll be some announcements about specifics for you to think about, but also please do check your email, moderators and chairs. You got an email from Mila about some updates for your work later today. So please do check those emails. Um, last, before I introduce uh, um, our next speaker, um, Vanessa and uh, Casey, can you stand up really quick if you're comfortable? And Vanessa, where's Casey? She's probably doing something important. Casey's in the back. Vanessa here is gonna speak in a moment. These organizers from Stanford have been magnificent. And I wanna say wonderful colleagues, thank you to them so much. Thank you. And the last thank you, now that you're all sitting down, thank you so much, is to our sponsors. As I mentioned, IEEE Standards Association are our primary benefactor. Also wanna say thank you to the IEEE Industry Engagement Committee. You'll hear from them later. Uh, the Stanford University Center for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Thank you very much to our sponsors. Okay, now for our official welcome. It is with uh, great pleasure I want to introduce a mentor and a friend who also happens to be the Managing Director of the IEEE Standards Association and a member of the IEEE Management Council. Please welcome, warmly, Konstantinos Karahalios. So, what a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I have not prepared any speech. Um, just I wanted to see what happens here, absorb it, and react. And I must say I'm uh, a, a bit overwhelmed to see so many people, and in particular these people, uh, coming from all parts of the world to meet here with us for such a purpose. Uh, this is not the first time we do such an effort. Years ago, we started something which uh, brought really very, uh, a big change. We called it ethically aligned design. We created a community, like we're creating now a community. You are the seed of this community. You're already quite developed as a community, perhaps around 200 people. This is significant. Within two months, this came together. And uh, what we did with this community, they created their manifesto, the ethical aligned design, and they were half the way, perhaps, to create your, our, your own manifesto here. And this is, you're going very fast. And then uh, we, they didn't stay there with just the words. Immediately, we started creating the tools where we saw there are some issues, there are some things we can do immediately. And this is the beauty of IEEE. We are not a talking club. We are doing. And we created standards and certifications which made us famous all around the world. And there is nothing better. So, and uh, now it is possible, for instance, if we talk about any algorithmic decision-making system, to assess its quality with the tools we have created. So we delivered. And I hope we can deliver here too, and I'm sure we're going to do it. What we're talking about, how we can approach it, what are technology gaps, how to uh, incite innovation and collaboration there. So, because here we're a collaborative ecosystem which creates collective intelligence for everyone. And this is rare and beautiful. This is the best. I know, and uh, I'm not so active part of your community, but there is something I have done, and there's something I will continue to do until the end. 
to give all the necessary support for this to succeed. I promise you this. Thank you for creating this, and I'm looking forward for the next two days. Thank you so much. Next, wanted to invite Vanessa up front. Vanessa Parley, please give her a round of applause. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vanessa Parley. I manage the research programs at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. We like to say HAI. On behalf of all of us here at Stanford and HAI, um, I want to welcome all of you to this very important event on advancing technology for a sustainable planet. Three years ago, HAI was founded on a mission to support AI research, education, policy, and practice to better humanity. And we believe that AI has the potential to better our, everyone's lives, um, all people, all societies across the world. One of the most important goals of HAI was to provide a platform for humanists, technologists, industry leaders, civil society leaders to discuss and debate AI technologies. And we are very excited to bring all of you here today because you represent so many different industries and areas of expertise to discuss and debate how AI might help us achieve a net zero emissions future the really, really real risks of AI technologies and how we might mitigate those risks. Um, we have an incredible lineup of speakers with deep expertise in their areas, and I want to thank all of them for taking the time to be with us today. I want to thank John and IEEE um, and the Stanford Woods Institute for partnering with us on this event, and thank all of you for being here in person and virtually. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Vanessa, again to you and KC and to all of our Stanford colleagues. So it is with real genuine appreciation and, and with a, a, a warm friendship feeling uh, that I'm very excited to announce our main uh, keynote for the conference. Um, Alex Sandy Pentland. Sandy directs MIT's Human Dynamics Laboratory and the MIT Media Lab Entrepreneurship Program. He co-leads the World Economic Forum Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives, and he's a founding member of the advisory boards for Nissan, Motorola Mobility, Telefonica, and a variety of startup firms. He has previously helped create and direct MIT's Media Laboratory, the Media Lab Asia Laboratories at the Indian Institutes of Technology, and Strong Hospitals Center for Future Health. He is also currently a visiting scholar here at the Stanford's Digital Economy Lab. Please warmly welcome uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Sandy Pentland. Hi there. So honored to be here. Uh, thank you all. Um, I want to talk a little bit about where I think this should go. And obviously, it's my opinion, not everybody's opinion. Um, but I have maybe some street cred on this in some ways. So about 20 years ago, I had been doing uh, wearable technology. We had a whole, whole bunch of Borgs running around on the MIT campus. And I'd set up uh, digital, what we call digital town centers in remote villages throughout uh, uh, Central America and was, as John mentioned, setting up laboratories in India at the IITs to focus on the problems of India rather than the problems of New York. Uh, which was sort of a revelation to the uh, government there. Um, and out of all of that, I realized that data was a new element in society that we really hadn't had before. Uh, and the way to think about it is data is now a primary means of production. And when I say that, I'm quoting uh, also uh, President Xi of China, who's a leading voice for Marxism, so that's capital, and labor and their relationship. And he says, now there's a triumvirate. Data is part of that triumvirate. And so you should think about this, not as a minor thing. This is the days when we just invented money. Well, we just invented data. 
And now the problem is, of course, we don't know who owns it. We don't know what we're supposed to do with it. We don't know how to regulate it. And until we can figure that out, a lot of the things that we want to do, like Planet Positive, are going to be really difficult. As we've seen, it's very hard to get the whole world on the same page. So um, when I realized that we needed to focus on data, I did a couple of things. One is I managed to start a conversation in Davos at the World Economic Forum that included the Justice Minister of the EU and the head of the US Federal Trade Commission and the head of Citibank and the head of Microsoft and so forth about what we were going to do to be able to establish ownership for data. And that's where GDPR came from, quite directly. The Justice Minister of the EU took the things that we did there and moved them forward with uh, minor cheering and help from, from me and the other members. Uh, I also started a series of experiments. So these are country scale experiments. We would have all of the data that is in private hands, so mobile phone data, credit card data, and so forth, for entire countries, anonymized and aggregated to the census block level. So think of this as a rich census. Right? You can't tell anything about any individual person from this, but it's like, so it's like census data. And we did this uh, where we would have a, a contest to say, well, what good things can you do with this? And we got over 100 academic units all around the world, including the Global South, to come together with their ideas about what you could do with this. And we did Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Italy, UK on successive years. And what we discovered is you can identify pockets of poverty, you can measure inequality, you can look at the environment in ways that you wouldn't imagine, you can look at the governance, whether things are actually working or not, you can tell where the investment ought to be to get the maximum result from your investment in the grid or the road systems or whatever. It's amazing without endangering personal privacy, but having access at this granular level, this census block level, to private data. And people notice this. People in the uh, development uh, community notice this because, you know, most of what they do, they're flying blind. They have intuitions, but they don't really know because there was no data. And um, because of that, uh, the Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon, decided that he needed to have uh, a set of data revolutionaries, that's what he called them, to help forge the sustainable development goals. And I was part of that group. And what we decided was is that the sustainable development goals ought to have granular, like census block level granular, measurements of all of the sustainable development goals because it, they had noticed that with the Millennium Development Goals, if you didn't measure it, it didn't happen. All right? You can't figure out what to do if you don't know what's happening. It sounds very obvious, but for almost everything in the world, we don't have that, uh, that little bit of insight. And so we had built into the Sustainable Development Goals what's called the Tier 3 Measurement Techniques for Accountability and Measurement. And it really is like this rich census, and it's this different ways of measuring different things. Um, and some countries have done very well with this. Bangladesh, perhaps surprisingly. China, not surprisingly. Norway, not surprisingly. Many other countries have done parts of it in the year since uh, 2015. Uh, but in general, it's not everywhere the way we hoped and it's not shaping policy the way we hoped. And the reasons are sort of clear. It's embarrassing for many governments to have a scorecard. They like to say, we did this, and having something that's objective and uh, that says, no, you didn't, is, is a little bit of a problem. And plus, the charge went to the national statistical organizations. And you know they're not high on the funding list. So they are doing things. But it's a change of business for them. They really don't have the funding to do it and so forth. Today we have a lot of interest in ESG, which is much the same thing. It's a lot of the same uh, uh, types of issues that you want to mention. Um, and the thing that's really amazing about ESG is that it is guiding literally trillions of dollars of investment. 
So companies are very interested in this and willing to spend money to be able to establish these things, to be able to have, get a good report card so they can get lower interest rates, better loans, et cetera, et cetera, right? All good, except that the ESG things we have today are incoherent, contradictory, People talk about greenwashing, they're not wrong. <laughs> uh, and uh, it only applies to the internal operations of the company, which is like, okay, great. So Saudi Aramco is completely green. Wait a second, did we miss something, right? <laughs> um, and, and, but there is, in that movement, uh, this is what's called the scope three, which is, impact on the environment, the outside uh, sort of elements of it. And that, could, I would argue, there ought to be a scope four, which is on a community by community basis. What is the impact of this? Well, those scope th three things sound, to me, very much like the tier three in the sustainable development goals. And so my suggestion is, is why don't we actually take the billions of dollars of investment that have gone into developing the tier three measurement techniques, the thinking that's gone into that, and apply that to ESG, right? To make ESG something that is measurable, that's granular, that lets communities know what's happening to them so that they can take appropriate actions. Sounds sort of simple and obvious to me. I don't know, hopefully it does to you too. Um, but there are problems. One is, is that setting this sort of system up in a way that doesn't endanger privacy and doesn't endanger uh, proprietary data of countries or companies is difficult. There are ways to do this, and you see interesting areas like Web3 that is purporting to be able to do this, and with a little bit of added effort, we could develop things that are privacy-preserving techniques of measuring all of these different aspects of the world uh, and making that, those measurements public, just like the census data. That would be pretty amazing. So, so that sounds like an IEEE thing to me, right? I mean, we're building the tools, the open source tools, to be able to measure the world. Sounds good. You need a little bit of regulation, a little bit of sort of pushing in there too to make it all work, but you could do that. It's not that far. The other thing, though, is, uh, and this is for my academic friends, um, academics usually is very siloed. And uh, we need to get away with that. At the same time, we have this multivalent measurement framework. We need to have science that's multivalent, that takes into account all ranges of things. Like, for instance, during the pandemic, my group, which is a leading group for data analytics and social impact, uh, worked very closely with a lot of the world's leading epidemiologists, and we were shocked to see that their models didn't include things like socioeconomic structure. Rich people only pretty much talk to rich people, poor people to poor people, they live in different places, they have different types of jobs. Guess what? Disease spreads differently in those different communities. You know, <laughs> but that wasn't in the model. Similarly, susceptibility wasn't in most of the models. So. Young people are different than old people, not in the model. So as a result, the models were very poor at anything other than qualitative prediction. And of course, it didn't even begin to include things that are, at the time, very controversial, like mental health, like schooling, things like that, that, that are impacts of different policies that were not put into that mixture. Similarly, with climate, uh, I'm old enough <laughs> no, uh, there was a time when the climate scientists uh, would tell me with straight face that water was not important because water is in equilibrium with the uh, atmosphere. Well, you know, that's like just simply not true anymore, right? Uh, Ten years ago, I was being told sort of flat out that methane was not important because it only lasted a short period of time and there wasn't that much of it anyhow. And today you begin to see things about, well, what about uh, topsoil? What about other elements of the environment? The point is, is that it's not carbon, it's the whole ecology that's out of whack, right? They all interact with each other, so you can't focus on a particular thing, you have to focus on the network of interactions. And that's a very different type of science, 
And I was glad to see the Woods uh, Foundation here uh, because you need something that looks at the whole picture, not the individual pieces of the picture, which is the traditional way academics and science works. Um, so those are the two things that I think that the IEEE ought to put as its method of making uh, planet positive. Measurementality, bringing in, for instance, uh, wisdom of people that have lived on the land and, and the, uh, the traditional things. Like for instance, forest fires here in California, uh, finally they realized they needed to do control burns to avoid big wildfires, but when they tried it, they got it wrong and bad things happened. So they went to the native population to ask, how did you do it <laughs> hundreds of years ago? And, and they began to entertain different ways of doing it, finding different variables to do it. We need to draw on all sources of this sort of interdisciplinary knowledge to make this happen. And if we can get the IEEE part of this, I am convinced that all around the world, there are engineers, there are programmers, there are AI folk that would love to be able to build things like the scope three or tier three measurement techniques as open source, make them available for the government, validate them, and would be love to get involved in the science of how does the network of the ecology work and what can we do to be able to influence the network to get a total positive thing. And I know that this is in part uh, something that is a real IEEE thing, because I run a number, or I'm on the board of a number of uh, contests to do things like this. And you get high school kids who aren't interested in tech learning to do Python, building things, learning about data to control wildfires, to control topsoil loss, to control things like that. The kids are excited. We should be too, and we should support them. So that's my little bit. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, look forward to all the wonderful things we're gonna hear today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. And, and uh, uh, I'm gonna encourage you, I know hopefully you did on the plane, to read you know, the entire document, Strong Sustainability by Design, the first draft. And we have co-chairs of our metrics committee, Brian and Laura Friedrich, here in the front table. And if she's watching, Deborah Hagar, also the, 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 one of amazing minds behind that metrics chapter. And just in terms of what uh, uh, Sandy was saying, in terms of taking account of things that need to be counted. And things like the GDP were not built to measure caregiving, which largely includes women in education and the planet. And that's not to pick on the GDP, it's time as Sandy said and in my own words, to expand what we're counting to include those things that we know count the most. So with that, again, thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, I am really, really excited and honored to um, introduce both a friend and another mentor. Uh, as she puts it, I was like, what should I say for your bio? Because her bio is like seven pages long. And I was like, uh, what do I say? And she's like, why don't you say that I've been involved in sustainability um, since essentially I was a girl because my dad first gave me a copy of The Limits of Growth from the Club of Rome when it first came out. And if you haven't read that publication, I strongly recommend you do because it talks about the idea of infinite growth with finite resources is what economists call magical thinking and something that we can stop working in magic and focus on science, thanks to IEEE and Stanford. And with that, I'd like to introduce the chair of Planet Positive 2030, Michael Lucan. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to see you all. And I'd like to start by thanking Sandy for telling us that context matters. Right? What I heard was a terrific story. Context matters. Data and metrics matter. All together, we have to look at the systems that we are considering to change systems of systems, and utilize all sources of interdisciplinary knowledge, wisdom, know-how to build the networks to carry out the work 
within the context where the work needs to be done, be it local, regional, or global. So I thank you very much for setting the scene for us, Sandy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I heard fantastic welcomes today. I'd like to add one other welcome, and that is the welcome to all of the participants. The welcome to the participants here, uh, locally, and around the globe, live streamed, and I'm also extending the welcome to all the other folks that we are going to invite to join us. So welcome and a great big thank you to all of those who have been working very hard to make this possible. And uh, the thank you will extend to all of us who work together to uh, make this happen. Next slide, please. So why Planet Positive 2030? What do we actually mean by that? So this acti activity, this initiative, is talking about the entire planet, hence planet. It's an open and global initiative where we really try to develop a practical approach, practical solutions to achieve a sustainable planet. Positive means that we realize today we have actually been stealing a little bit from the planet, or maybe in certain places a lot from the planet. We have been using more resources than uh, we are putting back. So we are generating an imbalance. So positive means that we want to come to a, an approach, a process that will give more back to the planet than we are taking out on an ongoing basis. And why 2030? Next slide, please. So, we know that we need to get to a certain space with respect to GHG emissions by 2050. And in order to get there, we have to set interim goals. And the interim goal is to get to 2030 with, by halving the GHG emissions from 2005. That's a huge interim step. If we don't get there, um, predictions are that we will not make it to get to net zero by 2050. Hence, the 2030. And so what we want to do is make it very clear to people that waiting is not an option. The same as failure is not an option. So. Hence, planet, the entire planet, global, a global approach, local action, positive in every way, shape, or form, and a very urgent agenda for 2030. Because what we do know, need to do is preserve this one Earth that we've got. We don't have more. We have to put it in a shape that it will support life doesn't matter which life form, ours, the worm, the elephant, my favorite, the giraffe, the walrus, okay, for generations to come. That's our responsibility. And listening to Sandy and listening to other folks, I think we are smart enough to do this. What we have to do is band together, build this network to act together. We have to realize the urgency and act together. Next slide, please. So we tried to, and it took us a while, to um, put a goal up front, rather than these many words that I have used, what can we do? And so we figured what it does take to get there is to actually transform the society, because we have to take a different approach. It's not so much the me approach, it's the us approach. And us meaning not just humans, but us, the, bio, the inhabitants of the biosphere. And we do need to change infrastructure, because our infrastructure was built with the knowledge of 50 years ago or 100 years ago, not the knowledge that we have today. 
And it will take a multitude of solutions. They are financial, they are political, they are societal, and technical. And as coming from the IEEE side, what we want to put on the table are the technical solutions that we can provide. And building the networks to pull everybody together to actually take this multidisciplinary, multi-level approach to come up with contextualized solutions at every level. Because ultimately, context matters at a local level. We have to work with, say we want to provide uh, green energy um, in Alaska, in Timbuktu, in Cape Town, um, in India. The solutions are different. The context is different, so the solutions have to be different. So that's why I said we need contextualized solutions and share them so everybody has access. Next slide, please. So then the approach that we are taking, laying out, like looking at what we laid out as a goal, is to, to work together to bring the disciplines to the table, to approach it with the system thinking, and consensus building to get to solutions that we can recommend. That also means that this is not a one-time process. This means that we need to do this potentially over and over again because our knowledge will change, our knowledge base and know-how. Um, like when people say today, you know, why did we start using cars and drive them with gasoline? Well, people didn't know better at the time. They thought that was the best solution. I'm not trying, you know, trying not to blame people for making decisions based on the knowledge of their time. What we need to take from that is move forward and realize that our knowledge is changing all the time, the context is changing, and hence we have to be flexible enough and nimble enough to adjust. And that also means this is an ongoing responsibility for change. Next slide, please. So we talked already a little bit about multidisciplinary. So the contributors to this project is almost everybody, right? Not really. But technically speaking, involved is everybody because the stakeholders for this project is everybody around the globe. The contributors are those of us who are here those of us who are listening online, those of us who couldn't make it, and will be, hopefully, thousands more as we are moving this process forward, as we get feedback and so on. So this means experts. This means young people. This means indigenous people. This means people of different cultures, of different locations to bring the context to the table and the wisdom to the table for us to develop those contextualized solutions that we can use and share around the globe. Right now, I think we have about 230 people directly involved, and uh, we invite you to invite your friends to work with us to build this community. And they don't actually have to be your friends, they could be your enemies and bring, <laughs> bring other perspectives to the table, okay? <laughs> but we all have one, let, let's say we have one thing in common, actually two. We share values and we share a common goal, and that is Planet Positive 2030. We do want to make this world a better place, this flourishing green planet. Next slide, please. Okay then, so I got challenged, says, okay, so you make lots of words, so uh, what are we actually having for output? So, in our current state, we have been collecting the issues, not organized by technology, but by ecosystems. And a couple of um, particular items like guiding principles and metrics and economy and we're looking at uh, education and uh, a uh, commons platform. Out of this we will have a compendium. 
which we will share. It will be a Commons document. We will expect it to be having it out sometime in final living document form. In other words, it's only final for a day, and then other people will add to it uh, sometime, you know, no later than the middle of next year. Out of that, as we get the impetus, uh, the, uh, see the opportunities, we will do standards development, we will do road mapping. So there's other people who are almost standing by trying to take the input from this work to then move forward for, um, as I said, standards development and road mapping, etc. We've also committed to working on a set of tools, a tool, or at least an approach and framework regarding the accountability. Taking the data, developing the metrics, the input, of course, are the SDGs and ESG frameworks, uh, life, cycle assess life cycle assessments, and so on. So um, that is the second document, and hopefully that will help in the long run to support getting at the data, getting at being able to analyze, measuring progress or regress, uh, measuring the impact of the measures. Okay? Next slide, please. So I'm trying to give a couple of minutes back. I would like to thank you very much for um, being here, for uh, helping us with this fantastic work, because it's our work and uh, making our planet more positive than it is today, <laughs> giving back to the planet, making it flourishing uh, by 2030, reaching our goals. And uh, I'd like to ask you to extend the invitation to join. If you're not on the uh, direct list yet, please join us and invite other people to join so that we build this movement, this movement for all of us to ultimately live in a sustainability culture. That's the ultimate goal, I think. Thank you very much. Micah, that was excellent. Thank you so much. You know what's exciting? I was checking my math, uh, and I'm really good at math. Uh, it's eight years until 2030, eight years. Yeah, I'm at Stanford, so check my facts if I'm wrong. But that means, you know what we have permission to do based on what Micah said? Is to not worry as much about the systems that exist now if our priority is to have that child that we pictured in our mind be safe and flourishing. As it turns out, I was checking some other things. Our enemies also have children. Our enemies become our friends when we prioritize care over competition. I want my enemies to be my friends and I want their kids to be safe. Positive means we have eight years and, and when you start saying things like, but business is gonna be upset about this and policy, my answer is, you betcha. I'm upset, I'm not even good at recycling. But you know what we need to have happen is those kids be safe. So you have permission to dream beyond any limits in your heads for today. And that's what Micah just said. And thank you again, Micah. All right, I'm very honored to introduce our next guest. He is also going to be moderating our first panel. Um, and actually, if you were on the first panel, um, just to save some time while I introduce Chris, uh, please, all of our panelists, if you can start coming up on the stage and sitting, you should be mic'd up. Um, I think this is Rob, et cetera. Come on up and start sitting down um, on the, this. And please, yes, give a round of applause for our panelists. And then Chris Field is the Perry L. McCarty Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies at Stanford University. Chris's research focuses on climate change, especially solutions that improve lives, decrease the amount of future warming, and support vibrant economies. Recent projects emphasize decreasing risks from coastal flooding and wildfires. He has been deeply involved with national and international efforts to advance understanding of global ecology and climate change, and has widely, widely 
cited work has earned many recognitions, including election to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Max Planck Research Award, and the Roger Revel Medal. And hopefully I'm pronouncing all this, Chris, forgive me if I'm not. Uh, Chris is a member of the Board of Directors of the World Wildlife Fund in the U.S. and the Board of Trustees of the California Academy of Sciences. Chris, thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to join everyone this morning, and it's especially exciting from the perspective of a climate scientist to see a broader swath of the community really get us organized around the issue of tackling the defining challenge of our era. This group is a series of experts on various aspects of the climate challenge, the climate solutions, and I'll provide just a, a few words of, of introduction before they lay out uh, the issues that they see as, as most relevant to moving us from the kind of perspective that we've just been talking about to the planet positive perspective of 2030. You know, uh, it's frustrating to start a meeting like this when the news this morning was about the explosive growth of the Oak Fire in Mariposa County, where uh, we essentially are totally outside the bounds of our ability to manage catastrophic wildfires. We're just coming off a week where the UK had the highest temperatures ever recorded, where more than two-thirds of the people in the US are exposed to unhealthy high temperatures, and where the impacts of the climate changes that we've already introduced are really rolling over us like a, a steamroller. And the, the eight years that we've just been hearing about is, is incredibly important as a as a target, but it also is a massive challenge. And part of the reason that the, the work that we're all engaged in is so important is that independent of the things that we can contribute as individuals advancing technology, uh, we can aspire to grabbing the attention, the ear, the checkbook, the uh, computer of, of people around the world that we will need to mobilize. The big difference between solving the climate challenge and, and all the technology challenges we've dealt with in the past is that the climate challenge is of immense scale. It needs to be tackled power pole by power pole, by generating station, by solar plant, by, by tree that gets planted at the scale of, of billions and trillions of, of individual actions. And so as we think about confronting these issues of scale, we can begin to transition toward the vision of a planet positive. I'm thrilled to share the stage this morning with a, with a group of outstanding scholars. I'll say just a couple words about each, and then they'll introduce their slice of, of insight in the issue of climate impacts, adaptation, and mitigation. Start out with Robert Fish, who is past president of the IEEE Standards Association. He's a lecturer in computer science in Princeton and a member of the board of directors at IEEE. His area of expertise is um, visual communications and networking. Next, my Stanford colleague, Gabrielle Wong Perotti, is assistant professor in the Department of Earth System Science and a center fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary social scientist, theoretically grounded in psychology and decision science, who seeks to understand how people make decisions to address the impacts of climate change. And then uh, third, Anna Carolina Muller-Quiroz, a postdoctoral research investigating cognitive and effective implications of new media and technology in education. Uh, she conducts projects that bring technology innovation to education settings. And then finally, um, Jonathan Schulhoff, who's co-founder and CEO of the Footprint Coalition Ventures. Robert, let me start with you. Rob. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. <clears throat> so I, I should say that um, 
Uh, yeah, I got my start here at Stanford. I got a PhD of many decades ago here. And um, actually spent most of my career in industry. And today, among the other things that I do, is I'm chair of the IEEE's Industry Engagement Committee. Now, um, so what's the tie there? The tie is, is really simple. IEEE has about 400,000 members uh, globally. It's the largest technical professional society in the world, to our knowledge. Um, it has uh, about 100,000 students, so maybe a little bit more than that every year, depending upon what's happening with COVID. And um, uh, so there's both an established technical uh, uh, repertoire there, as well as a next generation coming up. Uh, those people are organized into 46 different technical societies and councils, everywhere from power and energy, which was actually the in 1884, the founding kind of area for IEEE, uh, communications, computers, signal processing. We actually run um, within our industrial application society uh, the largest concrete, um, by that I mean the building material, uh, conference in the world. So uh, IEEE has a very broad scale, very broad scope. and. Um, with that broad scope, it seems like somewhere in there we ought to be able to generate a lot of different technical ideas for dealing with greenhouse gases and other kinds of sustainability issues. The question is, uh, when you have so much expertise, which of the ideas are worthwhile pursuing and which ones maybe we shouldn't? And so I think this is really where the measurement techniques that we heard from our keynote uh, from Sandy Pentland uh, come in. Technologists are good at uh, coming up with ideas, um, and they're all enthusiastic about those ideas, and they think they're going to have global impact, but they're not so good at uh, measuring whether or not that's going to be something that we uh, will have a, an impact by 2030. And so I think really in IEEE, what we have to do is combine both the uh, innovative ideas coming out of our technical uh, societies uh, with uh, some measurement techniques that enable us to estimate the probability of whether or not a given uh, technical innovation is going to make a difference by 2030. And if you multiply a magnitude of something happening, uh, a magnitude of the effect that you're going to create with the probability of, of it actually happening, you get an expected value. And an expected value is simply a way for us to keep track on a dashboard or uh, other kind of thing in a dynamic way of whether or not we're making any progress for 2030. So I, I think, uh, the, this next eight years is going to be a great opportunity for us and also kind of a scary time. But uh, the IEEE is there to, to sort of help provide at least the technical part of, of the equation. And then uh, those probabilities that I talked about are going to be uh, created not by the technologists, but by maybe all of you who are um, better at the social, environmental, financial, other kinds of estimates that uh, go into making whether in a given technology is going to come to fruition. And so with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Okay, the, the program for this morning is we'll have brief opening comments from each of the panelists. I'll spend a few minutes asking questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Gabrielle. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna come at it from a, a slightly different perspective, and that's from the perspective of the users or the communities that might be affected by technologies or practices. Um, so as Chris mentioned, my work is on understanding how people respond to climate change, and then using that understanding to develop robust interventions that can help inform decisions that may improve an individual's livelihood or, or situation, their community or society at large. And so this can be mitigation or adaptation. So just thinking back um, to what I was doing last week, I was doing field work in, uh, the, at the, the Thule River Reservation, which is right outside Portersville. And it's, it abuts the Sequoia National Forest, which had, um, horrible wildfires last year, and the wildfires jumped from the National Forest to the reservation. And the work that we're doing there is to help them understand 
what their exposure is to wildfire smoke when it occurs. And as many of us know in the Central Valley, there is already high levels of ambient poor air quality in the area. And when we went there, you could literally see we, from the, the mountain that we were standing on, the wall of smog kind of meeting a wall of smoke. So um, individuals that live there are impacted by climate change on a daily basis. Um, so for whatever reason, there aren't um, air monitoring stations there. So the tribe is really interested in setting up a network of low cost sensors to get a better understanding of what their air quality is, any measures that they're taking, whether they be communications or other sorts of outreach measures to protect uh, the people who live on the reservation are actually effective. And they want to scale this up to see if they can have a low cost air pollution sensor network across tribes in the state of California. Just to give a little bit of context though, so while we were there, there was also a heat wave. We were standing outside in 103 degree heat. We found that many of the people who lived there, and I will say um, the reservation is set up to, to support 50 houses, now has 350 houses. Many people do not have electricity or even running water. We saw people carrying jugs um, and getting water uh, from, from a well while we were there. And so this is kind of mind boggling given that we are in, in the state of California. And they were telling us that um, the systems that they had that were ostensibly supposed to be progress to, to kind of better understand how we can help people, and there's a tremendous heat wave that was happening, the electricity went out at that time. And the way that they communicate is through Facebook. The electricity went out. They weren't able to reach elders. Um, and everyone basically had already gotten rid of their landlines. So thinking about how we adapt to climate change in situations like this to make robust uh, communication networks, to be able to use low cost sensors, to be able to understand what exposures are, those are the challenges that communities are facing. So creating those interventions, those technological solutions that are community based and practical and reasonable for people to enact, especially frontline communities like this. So those are those communities that are experiencing the first and worst of climate impacts is really imperative. So I just wanted to, to bring that up, that community perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll continue along the theme of communication and education with Anna Carolina. So uh, first, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. And I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab here at Stanford. My background is in cognitive psychology. And um, here in the lab, I'm in charge of the educational projects uh, focusing the use of VR, particularly for environmental education. Um, so my main interest is on how VR works not only in the classrooms, but also in museums, aquariums, or when you are at home using VR and you want to learn about the environment. Um, so here, um, I've been conducting several projects to understand the main adoption of this kind of technology, because we know that with the push of the industry, we are um, expecting to have uh, a high increase in adoption. But as Bob mentioned, uh, we want to be sure that we are evidence-based on what we are doing. So um, I've run some studies from lab studies and experimental studies and uh, field studies. And one of these studies um, I conducted here in California with uh, girls, middle school girls, where I compared VR to a desktop. So uh, those girls, they um, had a VR experience to talk about the human actions in the environment and uh, climate change issues, ocean acidification. And um, the girls in VR, they had this video, being able to explore this using the headset. And the girls on the desktop condition, they had the exact same uh, video, but using a computer monitor. So it was just this difference between groups. And uh, we measured learning in several ways, and we also measured one aspect of learning that's called self-efficacy. And the reason for that is that uh, research in VR has shown that one of the strengths of VR is being able to uh, tap into our emotions. 
And when we talk about climate change and pro-environmental behavior, we talk about engagement. And for engagement, we know that we have the understanding, the emotions, and the action. So VR is very, um, it was indicating that VR could be powerful in the emotion aspect of it. And uh, what we found uh, was that for learning, uh, the groups, they uh, uh, performed pretty uh, at the same way. Both groups learned a lot. Uh, but when we uh, evaluated high-level um, cognitive learning, then we found a significant difference between groups with participants in VR um, showing more uh, knowledge creation after uh, the intervention. And also, participants in VR showed higher self-efficacy um, after the intervention. And it means that they felt more able to learn and they felt more able to become scientists because we were measuring specifically towards uh, becoming scientists. And uh, beyond research, I'm also interested on um, social impact projects and uh, large scale implementations, implementations uh, based on um, evidences. So I'm also running, I study with 12,000 um, middle school and high school students from low income communities in Brazil and even um, indigenous villages over there where we are bringing the technology. And the idea is uh, also to bring some digital inclusion and allow those kids to be in touch with the technology and also understand how in a large scale we can use this kind of technology for climate change awareness and engagement. Thank you. And Jonathan will close it out with more of a perspective from the private sector. Sure, so uh, good morning. Uh, Footprint Coalition is a sustainable technology uh, community. And uh, our perspective on things, which was really forged by my partner, uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr., is that the power of uh, heroes and symbols to move the public to accept uh, new solutions to deal uh, with sustainability are enormously important. And so uh, what we have done is to take the approach of trying to create uh, a cross-platform digital publisher to um, uh, bring more scale to Robert's uh, ability as an individual who happens to be incredibly uh, uh, famous and uh, well accepted in uh, lots of different uh, communities around the world uh, and to try to then uh, think about new ways to activate people to care uh, about these issues. And so uh, we publish uh, a variety of content. We do that uh, to motivate the masses through uh, digital streaming in content that's oriented around mainstream audiences. And we do that with more uh, wonky kinds of publications, perhaps focused on uh, organizing people uh, in, uh, uh, in different uh, walks of life uh, around these issues, whether they're in uh, technology or whether they're uh, in their particular industry domain. Um, we do that in order to really uh, move people to take action, inspire people to join in this effort, uh, and that includes uh, the formation of new companies. It includes uh, people thinking about their own industry with this new lens. Uh, you know, my, my personal journey in getting here comes through uh, having been involved as, a, as an entrepreneur and a founder in bicycle sharing, which um, is really the ultimate uh, problem of the commons. If you want to get uh, a lot of diverse perspectives, uh, from people in a city, just tell them where they don't have it that you plan to take their parking spots and replace it with uh, bicycles. And what you realize uh, from an exercise like that is really uh, the power of the symbology of what you're doing to give people a new orientation around a public good. Uh, and, and so I've now committed myself to this nexus of uh, purpose, technology, and media to really try to drive uh, these issues forward. The ways that we do that in practice, one is to create media. We're using that media as a way to uh, develop uh, origination and original ideas 
around which are the things that are gain, going to gain acceptance to be able to move industries in more sustainable ways, to make investments uh, in those uh, types of companies, which is the work that I do on the venture capital side, and importantly, to try to broaden the access to those kinds of uh, efforts to as wide of an audience as possible. And here, uh, there is an aspect of this that is to democratize the ability for people to get involved because for the most part, early stage technology investment is really the province of large foundations and endowments that fund venture capital. But these issues being multi-generational, being very high passion score, uh, we think will be supercharged by having individual investors able to access those same uh, kinds of companies. And so part of what we're doing is uh, making these kinds of investments, which we are sourcing and bringing to light, uh, accessible to bring additional capital from uh, individuals that care across the world about these topics. So uh, that, that's a bit on us. Excellent. Thank you. And, and we've heard four really insightful comments on uh, activation, the concept that both John and Micah spoke of at the opening about how to transform people from uh, vaguely aware of the importance of an issue to being a, a real a crusader for, for making change happen. So thanks to Rob and Gabrielle and Anna Carolina and Jonathan. Let me uh, swing first to a question for Rob about wh why we need this activation. Uh, we're sitting in an environment where uh, the news is packed with climate stories. Everybody's aware that climate change is real, that we're seeing impacts now. And is the, is the activation challenge more that people don't understand the importance of the issue or they don't see a role for themselves in the development of the solutions? Well, I, I think my answer there is going to be a bit speculative, but um, I think it's both of those things that you just suggested, that there are people who, um, uh, you know, from a kind of assessing the effect that uh, climate change has had on their lives so far, they don't see it as the, um, as a question that is on, a, on the same level as food and shelter and their immediate family needs. And so I think um, translating these kinds of issues to those kinds of impacts will change the, or could change, the motivational structure by which people judge the kind of things that they see in the news, right? Because um, uh, I, I think people, you know, I live part of the year in Hawaii. I just came here from Hawaii, okay? Oh, and uh, in Hawaii, what happens in the mainland seems very far away and very foreign in some sense, although we're part of the same country, uh, to, to their lives because their lives are different. There are a lot of issues in sustaining an ecosystem on an island, particularly an island in the middle of the Pacific, that are quite different than what happens in California or uh, the southeast or other places like that. So. Um, I think translating it into local cultural context is a, a key, a key uh, uh, step in, in making, this, um, making this something that people care about. So, we, so even if there's a, a, a heat wave in the UK and if you're in Scotland, it's, it may not connect. Exactly. Uh, Ga Gabrielle, your, your focus is on helping people understand the level of risk that they face. And, and would you say that it, it, the starting point is that people don't accurately assess the risks that they encounter? So um, some of what we do is, is, my group does, is to try to understand how people's experiences are associated with perceptions of risk around climate change, and moreover, their intention and, and real actions around adaptation and mitigation and take, for example, the heat wave in the UK. You see a lot of different responses. Some people are breaking out the beer, sitting outside, it's like nothing is happening, this is fantastic. 
other people are like, this is serious, something, this is an indication that climate change is happening. And our work suggests that there are two, there are multiple things going on, and just kind of to build off what, of what you were saying. Experience in, alone isn't necessarily enough. There are other forces, um, perhaps other immediate needs, or other psychosocial processes that are occurring, kind of status quo bias or system justification to actually make a change is painful, painful to the pocketbook, painful to the way of life that I'm living that I enjoy right now. Not thinking about the next generation or the generation after that. Um, and so what we're finding is that not only is it experience, but it is what happens when you have that experience. Does something bad happen? And um, we're finding that to be the case. We're finding the case in the, the case studies that I'm looking at and these population level surveys that we're doing. When something bad happens, that is a window of opportunity to talk about climate change, to talk about mitigation, to talk about adaptation. It, it, it's interesting that your uh, definition of the switch that moves people from not activated to activated is potentially something bad happened. Uh, and Carolina, you spoke about connecting with the emotions and the importance of whatever your communications channel is, opening that, that window. And is, is this idea of connecting with the emotions basically the same as what Gabrielle said about having a, a real consequence, something bad happen? Uh, yes. I, uh, when we are talking about VR, for example, and we compare VR to other media, we can see that uh, what differs a lot is that in VR you can feel um, what you are experiencing more than uh, people on other uh, media. And uh, for example, one previous studies, uh, study in the lab where um, Grace Ann, a former PhD student, she compared um, cutting down a tree to uh, watching a video about cutting, cutting down a tree and reading about deforestation on paper consumption. So after um, the intervention, participants were in a room and um, they had this table with a glass of water and always the same amount of towel paper um, on the side. And the researcher would accidentally drop the water and ask the participant to help to clean up the spilled water. And they would uh, count the number of uh, paper towels they used. And what they found was that participants in VR, they used about 20% less paper to um, clean the spilled water. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have been investigating, so there is so much to learn about VR impacts on uh, climate change behavior, is that um, it's important that the person feels connection to the, um, feels personally inside the experience. And um, that's one thing, for example, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it can help us to shape those experiences in the future to make uh, the VR experiences more effective in that sense, to create uh, more personal identification with the situation in the, uh, the VR experience. And, and so if we think about progression toward real action by 2030, uh, Gabrielle talks about bad stuff happening, and when you talk about VR generating the same kinds of responses, the basic idea is that we can short circuit the having to wait for the bad thing to happen, even though in many cases it is happening now. Yeah. Jonathan, when, uh, you've spoken a lot about the um, power of the, of the publishing industry. Uh, how important do you think it is to utilize new kinds of venues in publishing like VR? Well, look, I, I think that the public will be limited in how much it is going to respond to doom and gloom, unfortunately. Uh, people are willing to stick their heads in the sand. They don't want to hear it. They have focused on much more shorter term kinds of solutions. Um, and so for us, we try to find market-based solutions that are offering better alternatives uh, but it's a bit like, you know, sticking your vegetables into the, uh, uh, into the meal for your children, right? You want to do it in a way that they will enjoy. And so, you know, for us, we have to find ways of making this stuff cool and relatable and the things that people want to do. Uh, I uh, think that for anybody doing sustainability, you all should go to Copenhagen if you haven't been, uh, happen to take a trip there. And, you know, 
recently, and you're reminded at every turn, large and small, of ways in which the community is getting behind the shared issues that are faced. So when they put a waste to energy treatment facility in the city, uh, they don't figure out how far away and how to obfuscate it uh, it can be. But instead, it is an iconic Bjark Engels architectural beauty that's there to see, to be used as a ski hill. It's a deliberate symbol of progress. And they're a waste importer, and it gives 95% of the energy to the city. How inspiring. And you know, so I think part of the, the, the work that we're trying to do is thinking about how to inspire generations to adopt new solutions. We think about the sort of basic human necessities, food, transportation, uh, the homes that we live in, the fashions that we wear. These are all areas that are in need of a massive transformation. And the amount, the good news is, the optimistic message is, is that the companies that are forming ways of delivering new products and solutions that are planet friendly are the companies that our children want to join and be associated with. The rise of the eco-conscious consumer, the, the rise of the corporate goals that uh, are being publicly announced should be celebrated as opportunities for hope. And so that's what we're trying to do uh, uh, in, in, in playing our little part in, in making this happen. I think these four responses have done a spectacular job of setting up the challenge we face, which is balancing the important but uh, depressing message of climate impacts and the doom and gloom they imply uh, with the real excitement of the opportunities for solutions. And one of the things I love about the Planet Positive 2030 framing is that it's really focused on n not only the benefits of stopping climate change, but the co-benefits that accrue as a result of better transportation, better communications, and better ways of interacting with, not only with nature, but with your friends and family and, and community. Rob, when you think about this two-edged message, the activation allows us to avoid climate impacts while at the same aspiring to a, to a better future, a more vibrant future, and how do you think about managing that balance as a, as a communicator and a visual communicator? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that certainly in IEEE we've thought is that um, is the communication with students as a, as a paradigm, I think, to understand how you frame a question in a way that will attract a new generation of people to, to work on those issues. And um, I don't know that I know the answer yet, but certainly the responses that we see from young people, in particular in trying to get their first job or their second job, which happens pretty fast after their first, first job these days, um, is that working on issues of importance makes them feel better about themselves. And if you can make somebody feel better about themselves, then they're more likely to devote their time and effort and, and energy to it. So I think communicating in that way, um, where you're improving somebody's self-image um, through, uh, through posing a, self, a, a set of problems, is likely to uh, result in more engagement. And uh, again, sort of from the industry engagement point of view, companies want to recruit young people. They, at least I think they still do. <laughs> um, and so uh, there needs to be a message that enables them to do that. And it's not um, create another social media mechanism. It's, it's something else. And, and maybe, uh, maybe phrasing this in the right way might, might be a way of doing that. Gabrielle, one of the challenges that we've faced in terms of getting people excited about the technologies for climate change solutions is that they're often perceived as a replacement technology rather than a new capability. It's not like you go from not having a smartphone to having a smartphone. It's like when you flip the light switch, you can know in your heart of hearts that 
the electrons are coming from sunshine rather than a fossil fuel, but getting people excited about this um, replacement aspect has been a, it's been a barrier to building, building action. How, how do you think about helping people understand that it really does make a big difference to have those electrons come from sunshine? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that um, they're probably, you're probably going to need a multi-pronged approach, um, including regulations and mandates and things like that, um, because once people get habituated to a certain brand or a certain way of doing things, sometimes that can be very hard to kind of break that cycle. But there are moments where people have, I know, for example, significant life change, or there are opportunities, for example, when these events happen, where you can kind of change the conversation. And that might be a nice entryway into talking about different ways of doing things or to switch to different ways, perhaps, of consuming or purchasing electricity. So I, I think that there are those opportunities. And there are also different ways of leveraging um, social influencers or kind of social networks. Um, and social norms to help people think differently about these issues. And that's some of the work that we're doing right now is leveraging social norms to kind of see if we can affect behavior in that way. Jonathan, your example of the waste to energy plan in Copenhagen was kind of um, glamorizing, making exciting one of these replacement technologies. I'm sure Coben had some kind of way to get rid of waste and some kind of way to, to make district heating and do you want to say a little more about what, what you see as the psychology and the potential impact of, of really featuring these replacement technologies? Well, I, I think it's, it's really about giving people a sense that they can contribute, that they can self-advocate. I mean, it's a bit what you were saying, Bob, about the same thing, about how do you introduce ways of giving people a sense that that they can do that and and uh, and have meaning. Uh, you know, Copenhagen doesn't just do that at the macro symbolism level. Uh, you can rent a kayak in Copenhagen for the cost of taking a bucket with you to clean up their waterways and pick up trash. And the net result of that is that when you walk around the city, people are constantly stripping off all their clothes and jumping into the canal because it's so clean. <laughs> uh, and it's you know it's a it's just a better uh, city, and it's in, in the sense of community and the ways that they deliberately go about activating that community. So, you know, we try to take some lessons from that and say, you know, what can we do to foment communities of the caring and make what they're doing something that people will take notice of, uh, that becomes entertaining, that becomes... Uh, uh, aspirational, and uh, and so we're always looking for moments uh, to do that. You know, we're drawing inspiration from the true heroes of the story, who are the inventors, who are the people that are doing all of this uh, work. And so, you know, we just try to listen and, and see if we can amplify uh, some things uh, in innovative ways that will get more and more people uh, into it. But I would say this. You know, fundamentally, I think. Getting that reaction sooner, get positive feedback loops for the work, especially if we're, this, the work that we're doing here is talking about how do we harness the power of AI to, to uh, make these things happen, then the measuring of whether you are fomenting that kind of response from community should be one of the data sets being assembled. It should be done sooner or as soon as possible so that you can uh, you know, make those technologies work for you uh, and make those communities work for you in launching. I'm, I know I'm going a little bit long here, but let me just say uh, one of the most powerful things we did in breaking open Bike Share, which was a regulated partnership with cities when I was doing it, not an unregulated put it out in the street and ask for forgiveness kind of approach, which is what came later. Uh, and, and you really had to convince the cities that they would take this kind of risk with their public infrastructure. And the best ways we would do that would be to go into smaller communities and get local business owners and local constituents from a wide array of actors to drop pins on a map 
And those pins on a map were a visual statement of a community that wanted it, that a local po politician could respond to. Uh, and then, you know, you, you grow by taking territory block by block or district by district, and those symbols start to really echo one another. So it's just an example of, of how to get that community response early in the rollout of what you're trying to do. Uh, Carolina, we've, we've been talking a lot about kind of boring infrastructure stuff, uh, where electrons come from, how you get rid of your trash, and how you get around the, the town. Um, when you hear about these steps to solutions to the climate crisis, what do you think in terms of communicating to make them activate people's emotions? Yeah, that's an important part of the communication. So um, colleagues' research has shown that, um, for example, if you communicate focusing on the um, downside and um, you know, increasing fear about the future, um, some people, ju they just freeze and they don't take action. So uh, one of the things that we always emphasize when you know, we are developing a VR experience, that we are uh, willing to encourage uh, pro-environmental behavior and talk about the environment and increase awareness, we always end with um, strategies for mitigation. So people, they can uh, feel what can be done. They can feel the future with those strategies in place. So we work with some projections as well. And um, so they can uh, feel more um, self-efficacy, like they can feel that they can do something and contribute uh, to implement those strategies. So um, the way uh, we frame, and that's one study that we are running right now, the way that the information is framed um, has an impact on um, people's behavior and um, how much they um, engage with that um, issue as well. We're, we're gonna transition in just a couple of minutes to questions from the audience. For that, uh, if you have a question, please come to one of the microphones. I see them at the front of the room and I can't see whether there are any others, but um, we'll, I'm gonna ask one more quick question and people who have a question uh, of their own should make their way gradually to the microphones. And, and the, the last thing that I wanted to ask the panelists concerns, how to think about this family of climate crisis solutions. And to me, they, they range from uh, these kind of boring, hard to motivate infrastructure things about like, where the electricity comes from to, uh, to really transformational things ab about the way we live and work. And you know, as a uh, relatively recent transitioner to an electric vehicle, I'm just amazed at how much better a driving experience it is and, and how the whole idea of having the vehicle contribute to solving climate change it sort of pales in comparison to just how much more fun and satisfying it is to get around in this, this thing that's powered by electrons from the sun. And, and I wonder how, how you think as communicators about helping people um, get the right balance between that here's really a, something that can make your life better as opposed to here's something that is like a tax to help you address the climate crisis. Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting you raise the electric vehicle uh, issue because um, you know electric vehicles are not a new technology. They go back to the dawn of the, the automobile era and um, they were actually quite widely adopted in the beginning, um, uh, particularly by doctors. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, uh, early uh, internal combustion engines were kind of hard to start, but uh, electrical engines just turn over, and doctors who had to get to house calls, if any of you ever remember that, uh, you know, found them very, very good. But the technology was immature. Uh, the lead-acid batteries that they had were, were not that good, and they got you know, about 10 or 15 miles on a, on a, on a set of recharges. So the, the uh, electric vehicles today, though, have uh, come to a situation where we've crossed the threshold on a variety of things. The technology is much more mature. Um, particularly in recent days, it's uh, cheaper to run. Um, the, uh, uh, um, the personal gratification, which is, I think, really what you, you headed on, 
uh, hit on it just then is, is there because they're doing something for the environment and enjoying themselves and saving money and they have a good technology that's effective. And so those multiple kinds of thresholds need to be crossed in a variety of things. I think uh, the other thing actually I would ask really is not so much from a personal view but from a corporate point of view, right? So the question is, well, yeah, there's sort of greenwashing um, in some sense of making a corporation feel good, but there are also fiduciary issues, I think, in companies where they need to uh, protect themselves against um, uh, accusations of financial misdoing and other things like that, particularly with stranded assets and, and other types of things like that. So I wonder whether or not for companies as well, we're getting to a threshold where it can not only make them feel good, but they can be uh, positive for their uh, fiduciary responsibilities as well. Is it, would anyone else like to comment on this issue of how to think about the technologies that make our lives better in a, a personal and uh, intrinsic way as opposed to the uh, general contribution to making the earth more sustainable? One more comment maybe, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Anybody? I mean, I, I personally think that's a good idea because um, we're, a, we're not a homogeneous population, right? People are going to be motivated by different things and have different identities. Um, and so motivation through positive environmental impact or doing something about climate change may not, frankly, be interesting. And, and for some segment of population, it's kind of the antithesis of how they see themselves. So um, really highlighting the benefits of, for various audiences, I think, is going to be really important. And so, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, this is why we try to focus on market-based solutions. And I think it's, it's only the promise of crossing that chasm where you can get enough people to understand the benefits, not for the climate goals, which are important and they feel great, uh, but you know, for just the quality of the product they're purchasing at the price that they're getting it. Uh, but the good news is, is when you draw people in for purpose to build new things that are climate friendly, new market rate solution type products merge, you know, so, you know, we're, we're always finding stuff like this, you know, a great example that I love is uh, the reinvention of the, uh, uh, of the circuit breaker panel in the home. Right? The circuit breaker panel, is, if you wanted a symbol of old technology, you know, go and look at your circuit breaker panel. It hasn't been, there hasn't been innovation there in 130, 40, I mean, someone else, this conference will tell me exactly how old that invention is, but the idea that you have a fixed current to each circuit that uh, you can't dynamically move somewhere else when you need it, uh, and worse, for me anyway, when I, I live in a temperate environment, we get lots of surges. I have to go downstairs to a very inhospitable place multiple times a week to go flick one of these switches when you know everything else I control in my life with an app. Uh, it's sort of obvious. Why would you buy uh, a, an old circuit breaker if you knew that there was a, uh, a software controlled app enabled device that could move power dynamically between different things in your home. So it's, you know, any number of things will emerge. And, and that, again, I think is the, is the promise of, of what we can do together in present, presenting new solutions. This kind of optimistic note about where we have real opportunities for making lives better at the same time we're addressing a deep crisis, is, it, it really is a note of optimism. Let's turn to questions. And I think the first one may be on this side. Oh, you were first? Oh, I apologize. Please go ahead. Meilin Fang, Chair of the People's Centre Internet. Uh, there's an elephant coming into the room. Uh, John Doerr wrote the book, Speed and Scale. He has just given Stanford the largest gift, $1.1 billion for a climate school. I wonder if the panel will address how they could imagine, because things are still up in the air, how could the IEEE and the Stanford Climate School actually come together to make a huge difference in the world, to actually do this at speed and scale? I might start out with a quick comment, and thank you for, for pointing out the um, potential and the boldness of Stanford's commitment to a 
new school focused on climate and sustainability. I think Stanford's exactly the right place to do this because Stanford really has been a pioneer in taking solutions to scale. I think they've been more successful with tech and biomedical than with sustainability, but it means a lot of the fundamental lessons have already been learned. I think the conversation we've had this morning speaks to the next kind of challenges, which are uh, partly technological, but even more than that, they're at the level of communicating effectively, of finding what speaks to each individual and helping activate them, and, and figuring out the relationship between what happens in the for-profit sector, what happens in the non-profit sector, and how a web of communications ties those things together and accelerates them. Other, other thoughts on this? Um, Gabrielle is a like, co-faculty member here. What do, what do you think? I mean, I, I think there's tremendous opportunity. This is very exciting. And um, Robert, kind of speaking to what you're saying about the level of enthusiasm and opportunity for students to really engage, the faculty are really thinking, well, how do we train students for impact, for real world impact, uh, policy impact, solutions impact? So that, I, that seems to be, for me, where a lot of energy is kind of coalescing, which is really exciting. In addition to a number of initiatives that the new school is rolling out, including the sustainability accelerator, taking these great ideas that we have, bringing it together interdisciplinary teams, and really getting, getting impact out in a year or a couple of years. So that that's, seems to be where we're really coalescing. It's very exciting. Can I just add just one, one quick thought, which is, you know, sustainability, it needs to permeate all of the core disciplines that need to then coalesce in every field, you know. Which, microbiologists working on fermentation problems for agriculture or new foods or new materials or new clothing or new modes of, of creating energy. So all of a sudden, that discipline can have an overlay of sustainability, and you can see that multiplied across all the disciplines that are here, including, obviously, human-centered artificial intelligence, what we're doing here. But it, you know, I think that's the opportunity here, is to really focus it and get it down to all of the individual uh, disciplines. And, and at some level, the impact of the school needs to be based on partnerships, partnerships across different parts of the university with IEEE and other organizations and, and with the whole world. So we won't be successful if we try and do this by ourselves. Over here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Max. I'm the co-chair for the uh, Forestry Committee for the actually Plan Positive section. Uh, you know, with my committee, we've been thinking a lot about ways that we can really uh, more dynamically represent both the plight, uh, the, the challenge, as well as the opportunity of, of stewarding our, our sort of you know, forestry, especially the things that keep us, you know, the lungs of our planet. Um, I want to reference actually something that both Gabriella and also Jonathan mentioned, which is I was able to attend COP25. Uh, and this is in Madrid in 2019. And COP is a 4,000 person event, right? It's a very strict attendance limit. You have to get a ticket, it's very difficult to get a ticket. And while I was there, um, Greta Thunberg shows up on the third day, and she had been redirected because she was taking a non-powered you know, powered boat to go down to Chile for the original COP. And with her came 500,000 people. People who had traveled across the continent to Europe on their own money, their own you know, fees, show up and stand in the coat. They weren't even allowed to go into the COP pavilion. And I had this very distinct moment standing at the sort of doorstep. Right behind me were the 4,000 people who had gone to COP 25 times, 25 years. And ahead of me was the people who were you know, roughly 100 times in size. And I had this particular crystallization, I think, going back to what Jonathan said. So I think the solution we need to face is actually is out there. It's actually the 500,000 people, right? And also the 7 billion people. If we can find ways to, to, to proactively give them key opportunities to participate, then they can feel like this is part of their fight. Otherwise, I feel like we're going to be consigned to endless amounts of doom scrolling, right? You sort of turn on the news, is another catastrophic event that you're sort of powerless to help. So I really want to you know, ask our you know, esteemed panelists here, like how can we change the narrative structure of participation, um, either at a personal, financial, or, or like behavior level, right, that's able to aggregate and scale these decisions, right? We're starting with a very simple fact of just becoming personally carbon neutral. 
Um, I think that is a very low step. It costs you less than 100 US dollars a year, basically, currency neutral. How do we sort of promote these kind of powerful self reinforcing narratives, which, which then sort of cascade into political action and also kind of policy action? Great, thank you. Well, who'd like to comment on this question of how we, how we convert individuals into decision makers, into policy makers? How do we go from having uh, 4,000 negotiators at a UNFCCC conference of the parties to having every citizen on the planet feel like their agenda can make a difference? Uh, so uh, one thing that we have been seeing is that first, um, they need to understand the issue. And um, although all of us here, we understand pretty much what's uh, happening, the scenarios, we know that at large, just a small percent of, of people, they really know what's going on and um, how the scenarios are going to be. Um, that would be the first thing. And uh, second, um, having a personal, uh, meaningful connection to um, each of the issues that we are going to face related to climate change, not, not only you know, sea level rise, um, starvation, and, and, and fires, and all of those. Uh, and this individual uh, personal meaning uh, connection, um, it's hard to establish with you know, at-large communication. So, um, for example, one of the things that I can see uh, coming in the next years are you know, using artificial intelligence to shape VR experiences to help you find uh, meaningful experiences on that, that will um, strength this connection with the issue and can um, help create more engagement and that will reflect on actual action and uh, behavior change. You know, I'm struck at the potential for some of this technology to kind of reactivate democracy so that we could really see democratic participation spread. But on the other hand, we've also seen lots of indications that, that uh, digital technology hasn't provided the support for democratic institutions and for bottom-up democracy that might be appropriate. And thoughts on, on the, the role of artificial intelligence and, um, and new kinds of communication for enhancing participation in democracy? Well, one thing that you know, is a, a known fact is that, a known fact, it's a little redundant. Anyway, um, uh, communication media are additive. So that when you create a new medium, it doesn't displace old media, it adds to them. And uh, those people who would communicate in an old medium uh, will communicate in the new one. It's the same essential social network that you're going to set up. So it's not entirely clear to me that the media itself is having the negative effect. I think it's the content going into it that's um, generating some of, the, some of the bad effects. But we can combat that with putting good content in. And I think, uh, for instance, for instance, I think uh, with regard to climate change, um, if your perspective is only bad news, then people think there's nothing I can do about it. But there are examples of things that have been done within the human sphere that uh, did work. For instance, uh, some years ago, uh, it seems a long time ago now, there was, a, there was pointed out that uh, uh, um, fluorocarbons uh, from uh, aerosols were doing bad things to the ozone layer. Um, there was a, for whatever reason, there was a regulatory impulse that came together. They were banned. And sure enough, uh, the, uh, the uh, ozone layer issues were mitigated. So that's a positive piece of content. And I think if we can find other kinds of positive pieces of content to put out there, then at least some people will start feeling better about being active themselves and taking an, an active approach. So I, I would certainly recommend that. So could I just offer one, one other perspective, which is, you know, my guess is the political tendencies of most of the people discussing this subject and perhaps in this room are probably left-leaning uh, more so than right. Uh, and I think it is important in especially something like this, find ways of reaching to the opposite side of the spectrum, find ways of inspiring people to move to center at the least 
so we can get some collaborative approaches. Done. So, you know, that's certainly something we think about is how do we tell a story that really is going to be as inclusive as we can uh, in, uh, in trying to bring all people together. You know, I am under strict uh, instructions to not let the time go past the next 40 seconds. And so uh, we're not going to have time for additional questions, but I, I do want to extend a really deep thanks to, to Rob, Gabrielle, Anna Carolina, and, and Jonathan for opening a window onto what I think is going to be the key to success with this whole agenda, which is effective communication, finding ways to activate people uh, outside their daily lives to not only aspire to make the planet habitable, but to also aspire to the kind of vibrant, healthy, fulfilling lives that I think people have a right to expect, no matter what country they live in or what socioeconomic group they're in. So thank you, everyone. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Chris, thank you again for a wonderful panel and for that preparation and such a great diverse set of voices. Also want to say thank you to the people who did not get a chance to ask your questions. As a moderator, I'm always like, there's people left. That's wonderful. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, um, come up to Micah or I and uh, send them to us and we'll make sure to get them both to the panel and we'll try to address them in some way. Really appreciate all of the questions. Um, before we go to our first break, I just wanted to point out, and maybe the panelists know, there's a book I've been reading I highly recommend called A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet by a woman named Sarah Jaquette Ray. And while we don't want to focus on doom and gloom, one thing she mentions in the book is that, newsflash, this is really scary. I've been working now on sustainability for, wow, gosh, since January, <laughs> which is very short. It's very hard to not get depressed and freaked out. And what she points out is, um, not to be morbid, but to be human, dealing with the existential fear of climate crisis is much like dealing with death. And so there's five stages of grief in her experience and her research that we should go through to go from terror to nihilism to, I forget what the other two are, to a sort of joy. Not in any sense joy that you're happy, but joy like what an opportunity to work together, which is a lot of the core of what we are doing here. So with that wonderful morning, thank you to everyone tuning in. We're gonna do a tight, I'm gonna say five minutes, it's gonna turn into 10 uh, break before we come back for our second panel. Please give yourself a round of applause and we'll take a 10 minute break. While we're waiting for you to take your seats, I want to say thank you to one of our members. I think, I'm not sure, is Christina Anderson here live? Or maybe Christina, if you're on the stream, um, she is the first person to bless us with our hashtag. So we now have a hashtag, hashtag, here we go, ready? It's very exciting, Planet Positive 2030. So if you want to um, tweet um, or use that hashtag, uh, thank you, Christina. It is now Planet Positive 2030. Thank you so much for an excellent morning. Can we have a round of applause again for all of our panelists and speakers? Um, and then secondly, um, our panelists and Ram, if you can start heading to the front of the stage, that'd be great. Um, today we will be talking about environmental AI technology and ESG regulations. And the idea of the panel is to see how AI can help advance uh, environmental solutions as well as ESG reporting, but at the same time, what is the impact of AI on the environment? Um, and uh, we have uh, four panelists today. Uh, first, we have uh, Professor Jeff uh, Kyers, and sorry, maybe I will do the intros here. Uh, he's a professor of geological sciences and previously a professor of engineering resources engineering at Stanford. He also directs the Stanford Center for Earth Resources Forecasting, an industrial affiliates program in decision-making under uncertainty. His research interests are in quantifying uncertainty and risk. Um, then we have uh, Peter Henderson. He's a PhD student in computer science and a JD candidate 
uh, both at Stanford in the CS department and the law school. Um, his research focuses on the use of AI to make governments more efficient and fair, ensuring AI isn't developed in, deployed in ways that can harm people and create new ML methods that are beneficial to society. Then we have Kathy Baxter. She is architect of ethical AI practice at Salesforce, where she develops research-informed best practices to educate Salesforce employees, customers, and the industry, as well as the development of responsible AI. And finally, uh, we have Melodina Stephens. She currently heads the Master of Innovation program at Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government in Dubai. Um, and before that, she spent over a decade at the University of Wollongong, where she undertook the roles of Deputy Dean and MBA Program Director. She has uh, research interests in the area of strategy, agile government, crisis management, and entrepreneurship. Thank you, everyone. And starting with Kathy, um, sorry, with Melodina, uh, maybe <laughs> you can talk a little bit, uh, three minutes about your work. Okay, so um, I wear several hats. I've worked in academia, in the private sector, and now in the public sector. So I'm gonna try and bring in a couple of ideas from many of those themes. I've also worked in many countries across the world. So excuse me if I kind of run through multiple ideas. The first thing I think that's most important is, and I think previous people have talked about it, Sandy especially, is systems thinking. So we need more systems thinking, and this is across borders. I think across subject matter, we really looking at transdisciplinary, across geographies, across cultures. Um, this is especially important because John mentioned we have eight years till 2030. We have about 40% of the world's population living less than 100 kilometers away from the coast. So we really don't have much time right now. We need to think across time. Much of what you're seeing today in AI is across five decades of investment in terms of research and technology. So we do have this limitation of how much time, how much investment. We need to think across sectors, industries, and across stakeholders. We cannot do what we want to do without public-private partnerships, without every individual in this planet working towards the same goals. We have to think out of the box. The solutions are not in silos. And we have to think outside the Earth. I'm sad to say, but I already think we're doing the same thing on the moon and the other planets that we have done on the Earth. So we really need to take a pause on this and consider that. I have a couple of points about ESG. So I particularly don't like the term ESG. I think it's gamification. I don't think we can only focus on environment because there is sustainability. So if there are 17 SDGs and it's a lot more than just environment. So we need to really do justice and think about all of that. And the other issue is even with terms like you know, net zero, I worry about it because that becomes the metric. And it's not the same thing planting a new tree as opposed to having preserving a tree that's 100 years old. So we have to rethink some of these things. 40% of our trade is cross-border, is intra-trade, so it just keeps going up and down borders. Even more scary, 65% of data is cross-border. So these are huge carbon footprints that we need to consider. Uh, very briefly, I think, uh, just one last point. Uh, um, we do need to rethink e-waste recycling. I will talk about that later if we get an opportunity. I do believe we need to talk about the metaverse because this is the next big thing, $13 trillion and huge ramifications in terms of environment and culture. And last but not least, what's missing on the ESG conversations I think is governments adopting indicators. Now, I'm, um, maybe let's say the revamped ESGs, but governments themselves control 40% of the world's GDP in terms of budgets and employees, 20% of employees. So you don't see many governments rating themselves on these indicators, and I think they need to. So just a couple of points. Thank you so much for that. Um, Kathy, maybe you can go next, please. So my background is in applied psychology and human factors engineering. And so I bring to this work a deep understanding of how do we keep humans at the center of the solutions that we are creating. But from an ethical perspective, I take a biocentric orientation to ethics. So you can have a theocentric 
uh, human-centric or a biocentric perspective. Unfortunately, most of our politics, um, our uh, company decisions, uh, and policies are human-centric. They have been focused on what is the most convenient, what is the most efficient, and it hasn't been about keeping the earth and all of the creatures on it as an equal stakeholder to humans. And so in our work, how do we take a biocentric perspective and ethical orientation to our work? Working at Salesforce with our AI research team, for example, it's not enough to understand what are the potential biases, the potential unintended consequences of the models that we are creating. We also have to think about what are the potential environmental impacts of those models. We've seen that the large language models can take uh, up to an entire rail car worth of coal to train it. We know that we can use AI to make smarter decisions about how we route uh, the work to different data centers based on the temperature, the time of day, to make much more uh, intelligent decisions about how those uh, uh, resources are being used. And then finally, being really intelligent about AI for good projects. I think just as uh, some terminology like ESG can become greenwashing, AI for good projects can become um, uh, very much one society that feels like it knows better than others deciding how, what the best solution is. And I think the example that was given uh, earlier in the keynote about Native Americans better understanding how to control our forests rather than um, how um, uh, non-Native Americans have been taking care of them is a great example of that. So I will leave that that. Thank you. You there? Hi, uh, I'm a JD PhD candidate here uh, and Open Philanthropy AI Fellow. Um, my work focuses basically on a broad swath of uh, fields uh, for responsible AI, and that touches both on the regulatory side, hence the, the law school side of my work, uh, as well as new methods for uh, efficient models and policy decisions on how to make sure that um, when we develop machine learning models, as Kathy was saying, that we um, develop them in a responsible way that's reproducible, that there's no wasted effort and wasted compute, and that we can scale uh, responsibly. And so we're not using models that are unnecessarily big when something small will do um, and not have uh, increased impacts on the environment that we need to have. And so um, that touches on a lot of different both technical and policy sides of things, um, but I'm sure we'll get into that a bit more later. Thank you, Peter. And Jeff? Yes, hi. Um, my work is essentially using artificial intelligence to create uh, value in sustainable energy transition. And I'd like to give two examples. Um, I work together with Cobalt Metals, which is a mineral exploration company. So together with them, we raised about $200 million to to, for battery metal exploration. Uh, I think people are not well aware about the kind of deficit that we have currently, about $13 trillion in nickel, cobalt, and copper uh, for, for these electrical vehicles. So the artificial intelligence uh, was part of that fundraising and was part of the selling point. Uh, and um, you have to realize that um, in terms of funding, that's more funding that the entire mining industry spends on mineral exploration in one year. Um, so the AI comes in, in in the very complex decision and planning problem for finding minerals, which is extremely uh, inefficient. Uh, right now, it takes about one in 200 tries to find a mineral deposit. It takes about 10 years to go to mining. Uh, the other part uh, of the side is the environmental justice as well as national security issues related to that. For example, one of the biggest battery metal uh, producers is Russia. So if we're going to wean off natural gas or oil from Russia, we're back onto something new. Uh, the other one is, of course, that um, continents like Africa and even Greenland are going to be the, the victim of a lot of this mining that we're driving our beautiful Teslas here in Palo Alto. So that's a, a part that I, uh, that I work with. Uh, the other one that I work with is, is to get the oil and gas industry out of oil and gas business. 
um, work, for example, with uh, Austrian oil company uh, to get them into geothermal energy. Uh, for example, we'd like to um, electrify entire Vienna based on geothermal energy. Or traditionally, that company has been producing oil and gas. They have pledged uh, to get out of the business by 2040. And so here again, we need to, uh, we're using artificial intelligence uh, to do optimal planning of these operations. Uh, and this is extremely challenging because again, we think about geothermal energy as a green energy, but it isn't quite because it cre may create seismic, uh, induced seismicity, means earthquakes. Um, also, CO2 sequestration is a, bit a part of the business that oil and gas companies go into, but again, there we have to deal with the environmental issues related to leakage. And so, my group works uh, uh, with the industry to do this uh, kind of very complex optimal planning to make sure that these uh, greener operations actually are successful. Okay. Thank you very much for introductions. So, I want to kick off our session by discussing a little bit on the, the, the environmental impacts of AI. And Peter, I want to hear from you. Uh, there are these statements that, you know, do learning a deep neural network just emits as much as, you know, five cars over a year, and uh, perhaps the impact is not as big. So what, what is your insight working in this area? Right, yeah, so it should be said that any particular one model isn't necessarily, you know, going to dump, uh, you know, millions of tons of, of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. But it's all about scale, right? So if everybody starts training a giant model and everybody deploys a giant model for, to, you know, serve requests from millions of people. Now think about like Google search, right? So Google search will serve millions of customers every day. And if you had a giant model that w needed you know, 64 GPUs per one Google search, that's going to scale up really quickly and actually put you know, significant energy constraints uh, uh, in, and carbon emissions into the, uh, into the atmosphere. But we're obviously not there yet. I think people optimize a lot before you deploy a model and you don't need 64 GPUs for every request. But uh, it's all about thinking about, are we going in a direction that's going to scale to have actually significant impacts? Um, a few years ago, there was a, a paper that projected that Bitcoin alone could um, bring us to two degrees uh, increase in global temperature. And so what we really want to make sure is AI isn't causing these problems. And there are lots of ways to mitigate this, right? So one common way that people talk about is moving um, your machine learning jobs to clean energy grids. Because a lot of it is done in the cloud, you can actually do that for, for many different scenarios. And you can move them to energy grids like Quebec, which is all hydro. So there's a lot of solutions, but the point is to make sure that we don't scale to a point that is harmful to the environment when the goal of a lot of machine learning uh, work is you know, AI for social good, where we want to build more sustainable things. You want to optimize batteries. You want to uh, optimize energy grids. But if all that optimization leads to uh, more negative impact than it, it brings, positive impact than it brings, then it's you know, not really worth undertaking. So we just want to make sure that uh, we're taking all the right steps to mitigate any negative impacts from that work. Um, you, you said something interesting about moving jobs from one country to the next and so on. And I, I wanted to hear from uh, Kathy, what's the scale at which this can happen? Is this something that's being done in the industry today? Um, can you comment a little bit on, on that? Yeah, there have been some recent uh, stories published about Google doing this and, and a number of other cloud providers. And this is work that really needs to be done at the cloud provider level. You know, we shouldn't uh, be expecting individual researchers to try and figure out, okay, which of the data centers are on hydroelectric power? What's the temperature in Denmark right now? <laughs> like this, this, it can't be put at the individual researcher level. And so uh, cloud providers need to either uh, 
um, be able to optimize and route the jobs to the best location to make the most sustainable choices um, or give researchers tools to help make those choices, like asking them, does this uh, model need to be trained right now? Can this be delayed eight hours so that it runs at midnight instead? And so have a collaborative relationship between the cloud providers and the, and the researchers. Melodina, you know, as we move jobs from one country to the next, it's not just a technology issue. There is also, you know, you talked a little bit in your introduction about, you know, cross-border issues. Uh, is this something that different countries will accept? And is this a natural solution to the problem of the uh, emissions and other forms of impact caused by computing? Or are we just hiding the problem by shifting it to wherever things are okay now without really solving anything? What? So that's a good question. So if I look at ESGs, a lot of that is about sustainable development goals, but it's also about adopting universal human rights, right? And one of the universal human rights is the right to work. And I think this is important. I think when I see in California, the amount of homelessness and things like that. So unemployment is a growing issue. And we see that technology displaces jobs. So they say they will create 97 jobs, but then they displace 87 jobs. And those 87 cannot fill in the 97. So there's this question, whose responsibility is it to train people because they need a livelihood? And where is that best done? And also I think there's this skew because you have the countries that build, own, and deploy AI are mostly Western-based countries and China. But there are several countries, many countries around the world, that have younger populations, don't have jobs, and is technology the best answer? So we have a cultural issue also, and there is this very relevant, is what we're proposing relevant for that country and for its people, maybe, and the planet, right? Jeff, um, maybe you can comment a little bit. I know we had some earlier conversations that AI can be disruptive you know, for, let's say, first world countries and accelerating and, and making things at scale, but it can also disrupt the lives of people who depend on labor and things like that. How is it for, for the mining industry? Uh, can AI actually help uh, people working in mining or is it just going to be uh, replacing people in the field? Yeah, the, I mean, that's an, an excellent question, I, you know, because I think we often don't understand very well where materials come from and how much earth you have to move to get the materials. Um, the other one uh, that also mentioned maybe is, is industrial heat that we've talked about. 30% uh, of, of the world you know, uh, uses fossil fuels to create heat, which is very important to make materials. And so one of the things I look at is, is, is what is the global impact uh, of AI? Um, the AI is, is typically seen as a first world uh, topic. Uh, I always think AI needs to meet, uh, AI is basically digital meets, meets the physical world. That's one thing in, in this energy transition, but also the economic and social part. Um, what, what I'd like to, to work on is to use AI to increase essentially supply. Uh, because if we're going to limit, or if supply is going to be limited which has caused a lot of the world problems in oil and gas. Supply is limited, so we have conflict. Uh, if we can use AI to speed it up, that's number one, and we talked about speed and scale, and speed up at a large scale, and do it in countries uh, with significant regulation. Uh, so one such country that doesn't have regulation is the Congo. Uh, others are, well, I don't want to get <laughs> very political, but it's China. Uh, there's lots of problems environmentally, a lot of problems with workers. Um, you heard about the yogurts and things like that being put into, into uh, mining operations. So, so the, the increase, I think, is the increase in the supply uh, and also um, the emphasis that uh, mining industry uh, needs to engage in the, in the indigenous communities and uh, work together as such that, because what we also don't want is to mine stuff in over 30 years, put it in our cars and recycle it, and leave an economic wasteland in Zambia and all these countries 
where this mining is going to take place. So we have to have this ethical part of AI and not just say, wait, well, we can use AI to create value, make money. But what does that also mean for, for other countries and how do we mitigate those issues uh, are very important indeed. Are there particular approaches you think that are that integrate more, you know, the different people on this um, value chain of mining? Yeah, and that's something I'm, I'm starting to work on uh, in a, a continent uh, that I'm looking into is Greenland. Uh, Greenland uh, is, as you know, melting. Um, actually, I work on part of the melting too in the Jakobshaven Glacier. Uh, and as it does, it exposes uh, minerals that are indeed useful, rare earth elements and stuff like that. Uh, but Greenland is one of those countries that have about 50,000 people that are indigenous. Uh, and so I see the fact that um, the whole uh, process needs to start from mineral exploration. We can't say, here, we do mineral exploration, we find this, and now we go and ask people, can we get licensed to be mining? Uh, no, that's too late. So um, uh, one of the ideas that I have and, and actually starting to, uh, to collaborate on is to, is to go to Greenland and talk to the indigenous communities and, and explain what is mineral exploration, what is artificial intelligence, uh, and get, get there, essentially get uh, them uh, knowledge from them in terms of what is the land and where are the caribous and where is the this. So I think that you can, the AI that we develop can also have that human aspect and in, in a way can also include in its reward function, as we often say in, in AI, uh, other, other things that are just uh, monetary or, or, or things like that. And so including people right from the beginning uh, in, in the right way and not as we have done. I'm from Belgium originally and mining in the Congo was so good. And I think we want to do this different uh, this time around. So we have a chance, as, as somebody said earlier, there is a chance now to do it better. Uh, and that gives me uh, positive hope also for our planet. Oh, thank you very much. Peter, um, Jeff talked a little bit about kind of, you know, using AI in different regulatory frameworks. And when I was thinking about this session, one of the things that popped up in my mind is, do you think we require a regulatory framework for the use of AI in the future so that we can meet our climate goals and, and environmental objectives? Is that something you think is going to come? Is it feasible? Uh, have you studied that problem? Yeah, so um, I think governments around the world are certainly thinking about how to regulate AI. Uh, the EU in particular is uh, moving ahead with various regulations. Here in the US, there's various bills uh, in Congress right now about regulating the use of AI. But they're mostly targeted at how you use AI in terms of, you know, like recommender systems and um, advertising systems, things like that. In terms of the uh, environmental impact of uh, AI, I think it has to be a little bit more upstream because the environmental impact of AI is basically from the chips, right? Um, and of course there are, you know, I should, I should say that there are downstream algorithmic impacts and I think governments are moving ahead with, re with regulating that. But in terms of sustainability, if you're looking at you know, regulating chip manufacturing or the efficiency of chipsets, here in California, there was a recent regulation and some GPUs are not allowed to be sold here anymore because they're just not efficient enough, right? And that could be a path forward to sort of pushing innovation and forcing uh, more and more efficient chipsets. But um, you know, there are already incentives to do that. <laughs> you know, it's cheaper to run a more efficient chipset. Uh, it's just better for the company just because it's more cost efficient usually. Um, but uh, that might be something that as we think about uh, the impact of these chips and, and the impact of AI, we might want to think about that sort of regulation. But I think to, to really effectively regulate, you need data. And there's a, a, a little bit of a lack of data on sort of the scale of the problem as it relates to AI versus Bitcoin versus uh, other issues. And so I think step one is, is making sure that we have enough reporting, enough data to make good regulatory and policy decisions uh, that are, are founded in uh, data. Very good. So you mentioned this kind of reporting of data. Uh, 
Kathy, I know um, a lot of companies in the US, and you commented to me before this session that even Salesforce uh, do a big effort on kind of uh, reporting their sustainability impact through ESG and computing the metrics. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that process and what are some of the challenges you have faced in doing that? Data is everything. I think there was a comment made uh, in, the, in the keynote about you have to measure what matters. And that has traditionally been extremely difficult. A lot of the reporting that we've seen over the years have just been estimates. They haven't been actual measurements. And so there's no way for us to really know, are we truly getting better? And being able to uh, n be able to see what is correlation, what is causation, being able to identify leaks. If you don't know where your emissions are coming from, you can't possibly control them. And so we launched um, uh, our sustainability cloud, our net zero cloud, as a way for um, uh, not only ourselves, but our, also our largest customers to be able to measure the emissions for their entire supply and value chain, so scope one, two, and three. And we have also created a sustainability exhibit that we have added on with all of our partners, all of our suppliers, that asks all of our suppliers to agree to uh, meeting science-based uh, goals in their supply chain and then pr providing that data back to us. Now, we recognize that not every company is going to be in that place. Not every company is capturing that data. Not everybody is going to be able to hit all of those goals. But this exhibit creates a, a, a discussion with all of our suppliers globally so that we can understand where they are and they can uh, create higher goals for themselves than they might have if they were just left to their own devices. And so we very much believe high tide rises all boats, not only because the climate is warming and the oceans are gonna rise up the, the boats anyway, but get in the boat with us. And by all of us coming together, sharing all of our data together, then we can achieve our goals. But there's no way that any single company any single government is going to be able to solve this problem. So we've got to pool our data together and we've got to figure out the solutions together. Are, are there you know, particular principles and ideas of the um, ethics of AI that you could also apply to ESG? Because I, I, I know there are some principles of ESG, but there is no necessarily kind of an ethics on how that is done. Can, can you comment on that? Uh... Yeah, well, um, uh, as Peter was speaking to earlier with regards to regulations and, and policies and standards development as well, so I work with, with NIST on their uh, responsible AI framework and standard that they are developing, there aren't a lot of um, uh, guidelines specific to sustainability, even though Usually the very first principle that any company or organization has in terms of responsible AI is protecting human rights. How can we include protecting earth rights, protecting our environment as one of those requirements to be able to say that your AI is responsible? Um, but the challenge is like we're having disagreements as a community of how do, we, how do we even define AI in the first place? Are we going to regulate only machine learning? Should this also include all automation? Like if this, then that statements, Excel macros. You can do some, some incredibly biased, harmful impact with a, with a simple uh, Excel macro. And a lot of government agencies are still making decisions based on Excel macros. So like, if we can't even come to an agreement on what we mean by AI or what we mean by bias and fairness, how do we set, in a, set a baseline, set a standard that we all agree on about you know, the GPUs that we should be using? How much carbon emission is too much 
for the benefit of the model that is generating. I've gotten into arguments with individuals about use of um, uh, like DALI 2 or um, uh, GPT-3 about is how these models have been trained and the output and how they're being used. Is the benefit that you get from those worth the trade-off of the impact that it is having on the environment? And so this makes it incredibly difficult to um, bring in um, uh, this kind of decision making when we just we, we can't even agree on standards in the first place. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about AI, but I also think the same applies to kind of the estimates of the different metrics of impact you know corporations are having on the environment. What's the uncertainty on those? What is the uh, validity of the data and the methodology used? Uh, what are their suppliers reporting? I think this encompasses both the data and AI, and, and I, I agree with you. It's more general than just machine learning or deep learning, and I think it's a very important uh, problem, kind of establishing you know, these uh, ethics and, and best practices that we all need to follow for that. Um, Melodina, you know, in this discussion, we talked a lot about what I would call scope one, two, three, the, the most traditional way of thinking about environmental impacts from different organizations. Uh, but there is kind of a scope four, which is, well, if I'm an organization that sells a product and that product changes the behavior of my consumer in a certain way, and that kind of creates an increased impact on the environment, um, you know, how should we think about it? And I just wanted you to comment a little bit on that. I know you gave me an, a great example of uh, the metaverse and meta, and I thought you could share with our audience today your thoughts on that. So I think it's an interesting thing, um, and I think it's a chicken and egg story. Is the company responsible or is the consumer responsible? Because I think we have to address both of those things. I think somewhere along the way, there is a gap in education. So we had done an experiment in Germany with my students on fast fashions, as an example. I mean, just mentioning it. They swore that they, would, they wanted to protect the environment, that they would never use products that were going to destroy the environment. And that was the first phase of our study, which we did questionnaires. But the second phase was ethnographic. We went and looked at their cupboards. And wow, 90% <laughs> of their, their clothes were fast fashion, right? So there was this gap between the data we were collecting and what was actually happening on the ground. So data sometimes is lies or is not Right, so I think we have to be very careful when we me measure everything by data, simply because this could be a big challenge. We have to ask the right questions and make sure what we're measuring actually counts. So that's an important part. But the question of, you know, how do we get this conversation going on changing behaviors? Metaverse is a great example, and I'm thinking as we onboard more and more people onto this pl uh, platform at younger ages, let's think of young kids playing games, Will they appreciate an environment that's virtual and take care of it? Because we know you take care of what you interact with. So if you're not interacting with this environment, you're not feeling the ground on your feet, you're not actually understanding how the tree grows and how long it takes to plant a flower, then I don't know whether you will take care of it for tomorrow or day after if your world is entirely virtual. So I think we have to have those conversations now whether this is the path we want to go, and we then have to put the safeguards or the circuit breaker, someone mentioned that, into the system now. Very good. Uh, changing subjects a little bit, Jeff, you, you, when you, you're doing all this work on trying to um, help scale up mining of, of these metals and so on in a way that is not harmful to the environment, how much of it is predicated on data? What type of data is kind of missing out there? Do you think we need to kind of improve data sharing about the planet? What are you facing? That's a, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> so I think like I'm a different area of Earth, but like my uh, colleagues on, on the left here, um, we have the same problem of data being proprietary. Uh, certainly, Anything related to resources, land, um, is very proprietary. Um, also, for example, and I know, I know we've talked about that, remote sensing data. Uh, to, to make remote sensing data useful for mineral exploration, you need to have it at a three-meter scale. 
you can't download it off the internet for free. You don't have to pay somebody a lot of money to do that. Uh, and so there are a big advocate for, for open, open source data sets, and there are countries in the world, such as Canada and Australia, uh, who require companies to anything they do, anything they drill, anything geophysics they fly, anything they do with land has to be put in some proprietary data set, uh, in, an, in an open government-based data set. That is not the case for the United States. So in the United States, uh, you can do mineral exploration, period, simply because a lot of the data is owned privately by mining companies, other people uh, that are working on properties, and that prevents, strangely enough, the United States to do actually mineral exploration at a larger scale uh, such that we can uh, mine lithium, nickel, and so on in our country here, rather than saying we have to go to Australia and Canada and even worse, the Congo to do it. Uh, and so, so it's the same problem of, of how do we get people to, to share that? And I think there has to be some form of government regulation, as you see. Uh, the company I work with, Cobalt Metals, we are currently drilling in Canada right now. And the reason for that is because the Canadians have an open source database. And so a, a startup can come in and uh, use that for AI and determine where to go and, and so on, make mineral prospectivity maps using machine learning, and then uh, we use AI in the planning, um, essentially. And so that's only feasible uh, in these countries. It's, it's not feasible in the United States uh, because somehow we've given data up and given it to the industry and say, you can sell it to somebody else, but of course nobody buys it. Very good. Uh, Peter, you know, thinking about data, uh, when you were talking about, okay, I also want to know the impacts of AI on the environment when I'm running all these methods and so on, uh, and let's suppose I am a company like Google doing this, that's not just of interest of Google, it's also of interest of the general public since this is damage to the environment. Uh, do we have uh, regulations that enforce data sharing? How do we know what was actually executed what, how the impact is calculated, what is the data required to do that? Uh, are we ever gonna have the transparency or do we have to simply accept what you know, companies and so on publish as the truth? I think right now um, there are no effective regulations, at least here, on forcing transparency at this level of um, data, right? We don't know how much you know, carbon is generated from a particular data center uh, in Virginia or you know, Montreal or what have you. Companies are getting better because at publishing this simply a little bit through you know, peer pressure. <laughs> if all the researchers are saying, hey, you don't publish this data, that's not great, um, then it, it does put a little bit of pressure and we are seeing more transparency and you know, more publication of data. For example, I think uh, both uh, Azure, like Microsoft Azure and Google, and maybe also AWS have now sort of some, I think they're estimates <laughs> going back to the earlier discussion, but like some estimates of, you know, how much your workload will, will release in terms of carbon emissions and, you know, which data center is better for you to put things in. But again, I think those are emissions. And going back to the proprietary uh, data discussion, um, I don't think in many cases the companies want to necessarily release uh, information on, say, like, what is the energy efficiency of your brand new chip? Because you can say that the chip is really um, computationally efficient, but it could also be much more energy intensive. Um, so there are you know, incentives going both ways in terms of transparency and uh, keeping information uh, you know, close to the vest, but uh, I think the, there are no really regulations pushing at this level of granularity. Um, yeah. This is very interesting because for the power grid, the EPA monitors all the power generating stations and they have kind of, uh, they publish, you know, what was produced and for a long time these companies resisted it because it's very proprietary how much electricity you're producing at any given hour. So they publish the data with some delay mm -hmm. 
Um, they install their own monitoring equipment, so you have an independent assessment. Um, Kathy, do you think uh, something like this will happen for all of these ESG metrics, not just data centers, but when we think broadly um, for a company, or do you think this is something we need an outside agency to, step, to do that, or wh what's your opinion on that? Uh, some, uh, some folks here might be familiar with Climate Trace, which is Al Gore's um, uh, current investment. Uh, so they are taking data that's on the ground, that's publicly available, carbon uh, emission sensors, and they're combining it with satellite data as well and using AI. And they are able to see from heat maps and, and other data collection where are, what are the sources of methane and, and carbon that uh, are present? And they have found that um, the oil and gas industry is uh, the uh, worst at accurately reporting what their actual emissions are. So they're triangulating all of this data and using um, AI to be able to find where these sources um, so this is, uh, this is a, um, an agency or, or project that I think has a great deal of trust based on the individuals that are involved and, and backing this work. So, uh, and they're making all of this data public. And so uh, sources that we may not have ever thought to look at uh, and monitor, we could end up saying, wow, here is a type of, uh, of industry or a type of company um, that we weren't previously uh, looking over, we should really be looking at this. So I think that is uh, one opportunity uh, that will help make a lot of this data, to Jeff's point earlier, public, rather than uh, it being sequestered privately. Um, but we also need to encourage more companies to take a look at what is their superpower? What can they contribute to resolving the climate crisis? So at Salesforce, we, um, uh, all of the data that we get uh, um, from our suppliers uh, and recognizing what we were able to do with uh, tracking and reducing our own emissions through data that became uh, net zero cloud and then making it available to our customers. Uh, other things that we have looked at are things like tying our execs' um, salaries, uh, compensation to meeting DEI and sustainability goals that have been publicly set. Um, uh, reducing um, all of our uh, business travel emissions but also enabling employees to work from home so many companies are forcing their employees to come to come back to, uh, come back to work uh, at least a few days a week. And uh, I think about the commute that I used to do pre-COVID. I was commuting an hour and a half each way. That's just banana pants. Like, not only is that a just a horrific like um, uh, waste of my waste of my time and and um, poor life experience, but think about the the emissions that come from that as well. And you think about a global company. So for a company the size of Salesforce to say, you can work from anywhere. What kind of emissions does that then reduce? So by looking at what each company can do, their unique. Um, uh, context, technology, influence um, uh, in the industry, bringing all of these things together can be incredibly powerful if they make it a priority to make those investments. And Melodina, you know, we are discussing these ideas and one of the things that it has occurred to me is it's quite expensive to assess your environmental impact. It's quite expensive to run AI. Uh, how do we make this something for everyone in the planet, not just the United States, Europe, you know, the usual suspects? How do we make um, both the ability to have ESG data, to do environmental assessments at scale, um, and then even to use AI and understand its impacts and so on, um, what are steps that we need to take to, 
to ensure that? I think we need to start with education. It, I was kind of shocked how little people know about the SDGs. So I think if you started rattling it up, if we just did a surprise test, and then we did the universal human rights, I'm not sure whether anyone would get 100 out of 100. So we need to start with the fundamentals, and we've got to do global citizenship, and it needs to start in schools, I think. And if we start embedding these things, and they're powerful indicators, but building education around that, perhaps we wouldn't need as much AI because the values are there. I feel somewhere along the line we've lost those values. I wanted to bring in one additional important thing. I think we need to look at unintended side effects, and these are sometimes long term. And I'll give you an example. So there was a platform company. Um, it was used in a way such that it started the Rohingya crisis, right? These people, the refugees, ended up in Bangladesh. Now, what is it? So there's a tech company involved there. How does it impact the environment? The refugees were cutting down trees that was as much as 18 football fields a day. Because how are they going to take care of themselves? Bangladesh is a rainy, wet place. They needed food. They needed warmth. So the environmental impact was huge. Besides, I mean, there is also a human impact over there. So the unintended side effects, I think we need more awareness, more talking about these cases, not a reflection. Today, the way AI is, we don't have all the answers what's going to go wrong. Uh, the scale of adoption is tremendous. I love this example. 68 years for 50 million people to adopt the airplane, 19 days for Pokemon Go. <laughs> so we are going to make mistakes the amount that we can transparently, quickly share what went wrong and then get the community to help to make it right. This is what will change and what will make things work. Very good. So I wanted to open up the uh, panel for questions from the floor. So anybody has any questions? Please come to the mic, yeah. Can I speak into this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe right. you can go first. Sure. Oh. So this is to address uh, Professor Raj Gopal's question. And uh, I'm actually associated with the material science at Stanford and also with Slack. Can you speak a little louder? I am I'm associated with the material science department at Stanford and with Slack National Lab. And I am working with the Department of Energy on computing and, and uh, AI. So this is a paper that's about to come out. So I just would like to give you the numbers. Uh, the short, pithy comment is A is a major energy hog. And here are the numbers. Based on a paper that came from one of the big companies in the valley, to train a single natural language processing model, it took about over 30 days and about 10 to the power 21 floating point operations. If you use, convert that into energy, it comes down to about 613 kilowatt hours. And to give you context, the Washington DC consumes about the same energy for one month the energy it takes for the AI to get trained. Okay, so, and I, I gave very conservative numbers. I haven't given you the worst numbers. So, this is actually a problem. Even in the best case scenario, even if you reduced it three orders of magnitude, it still is higher or comparable to New York City or San Jose in terms of energy consumption. There is also the manufacturing cost that you mentioned, Peter. Uh, that is a different issue on microelectronics, but the energy associated with AI is, is being consumed disproportionately. And if you add in Bitcoin and driverless car, so we are trying to work with Department of Energy to bring sustainability into computing and just wanted to give you those numbers because you asked them. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Okay. Um, All right, hi. 
Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm a student in computer science. I had a question. Um, a lot of this panel has been discussing the policy around uh, company-run AI, right? But as a student, I noticed like there's tons of hype around AI right now, and every student wants to try it out. Um, do you think any regulations should be applied there? You know, technically, the models that students are making have been invented before. They don't have any direct, immediate societal benefit. Uh, you know, benefit. How can we kind of you know, decide whether or not a student should be able to train X, Y, or Z model when it could have potential environmental implications? Um, yeah, so actually, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that, because we, we used this example in a paper that we wrote a couple years ago uh, where we compared uh, if all the students ran uh, a, a less efficient algorithm in CS234, which is a, a course here at Stanford, versus all the students running a more efficient algorithm. And there's significant you know, energy cost savings, because every student's going to have to try out all these different configurations, re-implement it from scratch, try to get it to work. Um, and so yeah, I think definitely, you know, especially large courses at scale should think about, you know, if you're assigning a model to train to 500 students, maybe don't assign the GPT large model that's going to take uh, lots of compute. Uh, in terms of regulation, you know, that's a very fine-grained uh, level of regulation that, um, and, and when you're thinking about regulation, you have to think about enforcement too, right? So that's probably too fine-grained a level to, to regulate things at, but I think schools should think about policy decisions you know, at the school level uh, and how to think about these assignments. Um, and yeah, I think generally, I think one thing that we didn't mention more broadly about regulation here is enforceability, right? And so the EPA is not super uh, well-funded and extremely well-staffed, and they have you know, limited auditors, limited people to go out and investigate where are their violations of the environmental laws. And increasingly, the agencies have to turn to AI as well, right? And so um, to basically allocate resources, it's a giant resource allocation problem. And so when, when you know, everyone thinks about, uh, should we regulate this, should we regulate that, you have to think about you know, the 40 people at the EPA that are going to have to uh, go track down everybody who's violating this regulation. And if they're not able to do that and not able to effectively allocate resources, yep. um, you know, the regulation is, is not really worth much, right? So um, you, you really have to think both about uh, who is the best person to regulate. In this case, it's probably uh, pushing schools to, to think about how to set policies. I, if I could add to that, uh, so Rob Reich, who is a professor here at Stanford that I think um, many people may be aware of, and uh, he recently uh, wrote an article and, and uh, posted on Twitter about the need for a code of ethics a professional code of, of conduct and, and ethics, and he compares it to um, uh, bio-researchers with CRISPR. And so when individuals violate that code, then um, there would be agreement that peer-reviewed journals, conferences, events would not um, engage with the individuals that, that commit those violations. Um, you know, you can still post stuff on archive and uh, still get lots of visibility if you tweet it out, but at least no one um, of, of real stature or measure um, is going to con condone or um, uh, support the work that you've done. So I think creating a code of, of ethics when it comes to developing AI, implementing AI, that includes sustainability as a part of that is going to be important and having a set of principles. So transparency, again, going back to whether it's an individual company or like the OECD with responsible AI uh, principles, uh, transparency is usually one of the principles that are stated. So having Stanford be transparent about what is the carbon footprint of the models that the students are creating in each one of their CS classes. What are they doing year over year to try and lower those, uh, those emissions? Um, those are great things that can be done and you don't need regulation, you don't need an effective Congress um, to actually agree on anything, which is a great thing. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one little thing. We need to be careful um, not to conflate the amount of energy use with environmental impact. 
if you're using a lot of energy and all of it happen to be coming from solar, your environmental impact, if you think about life cycle emissions, is you know, how much you spend to build those solar panels. If you're a Stanford student and you wanted to minimize your impact, one of the things you can do, Stanford owns a lot of solar farms out here in California and a lot of solar panels on the campus. You could just try to uh, do your calculations whenever you know, the sun is at the peak or you can look at the solar profiles and track that and do something with that. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, different ways as well to think about this problem. It's not just of the size, amount of energy you consume, but how do you line it up with low carbon or emissions free energy? Um, thank you very much. Yeah. And um, uh, to put some numbers to that, I think uh, we looked at this in, in our, our work and I think it's about uh, during the daytime around noon, there's about 150 grams per kilowatt hour uh, released in terms of carbon. And then at night, it's about almost double that. So uh, it's, it's quite a big jump, you know, running during the day and, and at night. There you go. So don't do your homework at night. <laughs> <laughs> little way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, next. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Stephanie Camarina. Uh, I actually uh, came from Australia and I did offset my uh, footprint. Uh, I just completed a PhD in AI in the design of um, transition to sustainable food systems. And I find that it was useful to think of uh, that conversation around uh, sus the sustainability of AI and AI for sustainability uh, in the sense of, um, you know, maybe uh, thinking about uh, the sustainability of AI. That's definitely a problem that an engineer should be quite good at, um, you know, break breaking down to... Um, uh, tools, you know, helping sustainability practitioners like me uh, understand when we want to use technology, uh, what's the cost of it. And uh, so one of the things that uh, I find uh, a bit of a worry is that we, uh, we might be using AI and, and blockchain and the rest as something that will allow us to extract knowledge and minerals and um, you know other other uh, resources much faster, much more efficiently, um, and therefore become even worse at um, being human on a planet. Uh, I, my my question is really on the on the design of the future. Um, we're working with data that is data from the past. Uh, it's full of all of our biases. It's full of how we've seen the world until now. And the way we've, we're seeing the world today is what brought us to where we are in this state of crisis. So don't you think that now is the time to, to think about the type of data that actually is useful for the future? That is not the data that we have today. Um, I found that actually working with communities and involving them from the ground up, they're the ones who, um, instead of coming up with solution, they, they explain what the problems are, and then they guide you towards what type of data you need to start creating to change your future. What's your view on that? I actually like that. So there's a difference between data and wisdom. And I think that's that whole pyramid that we need to go back and address. Uh, especially with AI, data is brittle. So you cannot take it from one context, put it in another context. And like you said, it has a very limited shelf life. So we have to be very mindful of that. And I think that's a question we should be. But this is an education problem. There are people using it because they think, ah, it's big and an AI worked on it, so it's good. <laughs> and that's not necessarily true. So we have to teach them that the insights that you get is not wisdom. You still need to go and you know, check on that. Maybe the problem you're solving, the data is irrelevant. So again, there's a lot of work that we have to do as educationalists, I think. Each one of us who understands AI has to go and explain that because 
we, I mean, I grew up in a generation where we used the old telephones. Mm -hmm. and suddenly we moved into those big bricks of a mobile phone and today we've got these smartphones. And I know my children keep laughing and saying, you don't even know how to use everything that's there. And that's true, so we've coped, but that's not a good enough excuse. We have to educate. Hello, I'm Andy Hippel from Capgemini. We're a multinational consulting company with about 350,000 people, and our core mission changed two years ago. Now it's unleashing human energy through technology, AI being one of the big technologies, for an inclusive and sustainable world. So it's not just technology all the time, technology and people and unleashing human energy. So my question to the panelists is this. I would love your point of view on the importance of public-private partnerships in enabling the scale and acceleration of sustainable solutions that we need right now. Public-private collaboration is critical. Um, uh, your, your point was so incredibly well made about the limitations of our different government agencies. We keep asking them to do more and more with less and less, and um, they don't necessarily have all of the expertise. You know, all of the brilliant minds that uh, graduate from Stanford, you know, Google, uh, Meta, you know, hopefully Salesforce will snatch you up. Um, but there's, there's no chance <laughs> that, that the majority of you are going to go and work at a government uh, agency. And so we really have to work uh, collaboratively to ensure that we are bringing the best minds to solve the gnarliest problems that we are facing today. I'm on Singapore's ethical use of AI and data. Um, I've recently met with um, other governments in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important for us to take a global point of view and ensure that we are working with each other's governments. And it's not just, I'm in the US, so I'm gonna work with US agencies, but we all are collaborating together and we are creating the best solutions together because we are at a moment, it has to be yes and. We have to have everything that is on the table uh, and everybody has to bring their best to it. Um, if I can quickly add to that, uh, I think, you know, I think public-private partnerships are incredibly important, but it's also important that the public side of that does get some of the expertise in-house yeah. uh, because there needs to be, you know, continuity yeah. within the government. Uh, one thing that often happens, uh, maybe I shouldn't say often, but sometimes happens is that you, you know, pu uh, partner with a private entity, the private entity goes away for whatever reason, and then the public side of the equation doesn't know what to do with this and has to start over, right? So it's really important to build out that technical expertise within the public sector. And there's lots of ways to do this. Um, getting better at re recruiting, uh, you know, uh, tech students, and, and uh, there's also uh, new kind of formulas that, that the public sector is trying to, to pursue. For example, here at Stanford, uh, under the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Personnel Act and sort of student volunteer equivalents, there's a lot of partnerships with uh, academic institutions to build out some of that technical expertise. And what we've seen is uh, some of the students actually do go on to work at that government agency afterwards because you know, you've built that relationship uh, you've got your work you know, running, and you want to continue on at that federal agency. So I think those uh, types of partnerships can help uh, bring some of that technical expertise into the government to have that continuity going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Hi, thank you so much for this awesome panel. Uh, I'm Sanjana, I'm an air quality and renewable energy researcher and I also run an organization that does environmental hackathons. Um, so my friend's question over here actually kind of set the stage for my question really well because I wanted to ask about balancing public and private entities and kind of solving these problems uh, with the urgency that kind of our situation demands. Because uh, you know, I think what you said is true that oftentimes when you have graduates who are very smart, who are very ambitious, who are really looking to make their mark on the world in some way, the government is not their first choice or not their first thought, and I'd really like for us to consider why. 
that is. Because when you look at where the big innovations came from the last century, we think of NASA and their moonshot mission. We think of the huge ambitious undertaking by the EPA to allow us to have clean air to breathe, which is literally the bare minimum for doing anything else. Um, and kind of think about why we've allowed such disinvestment in public goods and such disinvestment in you know public investment at all levels, local, federal, state, uh, and kind of think also about as we move into a planet positive framework, how are we going to do that in a way where we are citizens first and consumers second? Yeah. Because I really worry about kind of how that sets the stage for equitable participation for everyone, right? If I, with an electrical engineering degree, make a choice and get a much higher paying job, I could have a much more outsized influence than what I actually did and got a research job with an electrical engineering degree and do not have as high a pay grade. So how would you respond to that? How can we kind of fix or begin to think about this disparity between public and private and the implications it has for sort of equitable participation in a just and livable future? So I like that. Oh, please go ahead, Jeff. Jeff, oh, thank you. That's an excellent question. As a as a teacher, you know that's that's on my mind. Um, I think for the current generation of students, I think they are still not enough aware of what the real problems and urgent problems are. I, I sit I stand in front of a, a classroom and ask them, "Where does the stuff that goes in your phone come from?" Nobody knows. Literally, nobody. I say, where does the cobalt come from? Nobody knows, right? So let's start there, uh, that there has to be this awareness. Now, once there's the awareness, then suddenly there's the enormous interest into what you're doing. Oh my God, this is all these things that are so and so important. And I think um, what is not, what, the problem right now a little bit is, or a lot, is that we are developing things we don't need. Yeah. Self-driving cars, language models, we don't need that to solve the problem, to, to, to save our planet. We need nothing of that, right? But yet, at the same time, big companies, tech companies going into these areas, we don't need metaverses to save our, uh, our, our planet. We need other things to save our planet, right? Once uh, students start to understand that there are these other things, suddenly there's a huge interest. So the problem lies in the pipeline, right? Is that how can we create that interest? Then how can we create courses and, and research within which they can do that interest and see a path towards, towards a, a job where they can see, hey, that's interesting. I don't think, personally, the government is that way to go because government is slow and we need fast, right? So I think there's a lot of, uh, of issues that come together, but I think the first thing is education of, of what are the important issues and how can we uh, 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 contribute well, to that. Wanna... I did want, because I, I represent government, I thought I did want to give a perspective. Uh, government works with wicked problems, and these are long, intractable, not easy to solve. And it was very interesting when the pandemic came, it wasn't exactly private sector that launched into the forefront, it was government that behind the scenes set the platform for that. So you do see a role that government, and government can be fast if it wants, but there is a perception and it will not pay as much as the yeah. private sector. So this is a fundamental question. The student has to make that choice. Do you want to work in public goods? And it's a different skill set. There's a lot of advocacy, stakeholder management in a government job, or do you want the quick pay, the visibility, the quick wins? And I think that's one of the challenges we have. The second thing is you ask that question, how can we change it? I've seen Estonia do some fantastic things around hackathons as an example. Of course, much smaller country, but able to go and get private sector involved. But in the UAE, and I come from the United Arab Emirates, one of the things we monitor is a majlis system where they will pull out a topic and everyone can come and take part in that discourse. So it's a very interesting concept, obviously much smaller governments than the United States, but it's a great way to start. And Switzerland has that even with the Canton system. So I think there are different forms of ways of getting that conversation on this space, but great question. The, the electricity grid provides a nice example of government. You have FERC and you know PUCs. You have a nonprofit that runs the grid, California System Operation, the ISOs. So I think that idea of having operations that are not for profit but that mediate and, and organize energy flows and so on and other flows could could be something for to, to think about. But um, 
Thank you for the excellent question. Thank you, sir. One last question, and I think we're well past the time here, so. Right, thank you for uh, taking the question. Uh, it's a question about uh, the language that we use uh, in these conversations and about um, how we're able to better decolonize um, the uh, narrative around the environmental impact that has taken place. Um, and so uh, in response to something you said, Jeff, we all, we all use language at times that, that um, may not fully capture the narrative, but I, I think you said something along the lines of, you know, what Belgium did in the Congo wasn't that great. And I, I think it actually might have been uh, genocide and that, you know, millions of people died uh, over the course of the last 150 years uh, to um, mine materials out of the earth, and including rubber. Um, and even as recently as 2014, uh, major human rights violations took place by Belgian companies bulldozing people's homes and restaurants around mining locations. And uh, I just think that that should maybe be more in the narrative because we have a responsibility when we're in a room like this in front of people and we're, I think there are still more white people than not in the room and, you know, uh, Africa has a lot of work to go um, in order to build the Great Green Wall and to bring 10 million jobs to the country and to try to capture more carbon. Uh, so I just wanted to draw attention to that and also as Planet Positive moves towards the next iteration in The Hague, um, you know, there is far more opportunity to have uh, Belgian representatives come to that conference and, and perhaps, Jeff, you might be able to introduce us or some of the organizers of Planet Positive to people that we can lobby to, um, especially in a place like The Hague where policy is so important and the kind of policy makers that will be at that conference. Uh, I, I think Belgium owes quite a bit uh, to the Congo, um, and, and there, there can't be enough that's done to make up for what happened. So, yeah, very, very nice. <laughs> uh, as, as a young kid, uh, as, as a young kid, uh, I grew up uh, uh, about the history of Belgium, of course, founded in 1830, and first Leopold I, and then Leopold II. Not at one single point, in my education was mentioned any genocide, was mentioned any colonization, anything. The only thing that was mentioned that there are good priests right now going to the Congo and helping the people become Christians, right? That's, that's not that long ago. This is 1960. And uh, my country has had a reckoning with that. I can tell you a little bit, just one thing, right? Is that we had humans as exposition in, in a museum in Brussels, coming over as animals, sitting in cages, right? This is the real thing, and that was Leopold II. And right now, just like in the United States, we're moving statues away, finally, but that's only been in the last five years that our royal, our royal house has been able to, to come to terms with that. And, I, I'd be great, I'd be love to, I mean, there are great books written about that and there's a, no, a number of great authors about that and love to, to get involved with that as well and, and, and talk about my, the ugly history of, the, of my country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank all the panelists and the audience and let's give them a hand of applause. Thank you. And let's give a round of applause to, to Ram, or Ram, forgive me, and I didn't read your full um, bio, and that was my bad. So while we're exiting, I'll, I'll read your bio. I said thank you. So um, Ram Raja Gopal, who you just heard do his excellent moderation, is an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, where he directs the Stanford Sustainable Systems Lab, focused on large-scale monitoring, data analytics, and stochastic control for infrastructure networks, in particular power networks, his current research interests in power systems are in the integration of renewables, smart distribution systems, and demand-side data analytics. Okay, a um, couple things before we go to lunch. We have some quick announcements. Uh, first of all, um, Casey, if you could put up that slide. Uh, Casey, uh, again, round of applause for Casey, who is doing such an awesome job for all we're doing. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, actually, I'm sorry, the assignments, Casey. We'll do this one after lunch. So, a um, couple things about the assignments you were given. Um, if you uh, picked uh, a room and then got an assignment for something else, uh, first of all, we recommend give the other room a shot. Part of the logic is a first-come, first-served basis. 
and also we want to try to have about the same number of people in each room. Um, that said, if you really want to go to a certain room, we don't want to keep you from doing that, but just it'd be great if you want to help us out by going to the room that you were assigned to. The, the 10 committees are all excellent. I've read the whole thing. Seriously, any place you go, you're going to have a really insightful time. If you see that you were listed as Gates, as in William Gates, um, you are going to be going to a different building. You get to have a bus ride. Cool. And what that means is there's a bus that's already waiting out front, I think, and you can take your boxed lunch and go over to the Gates building uh, sooner than later, and you can have lunch over there. So one thing is that we're basically moving our entire schedule half an hour forward, so don't worry, don't freak out, okay? But lunch is going to be whatever time it is now. What time is it now? Forgive me, I forgot my phone. 12.30. 12.30. So lunch is going to be about an hour, but we do have about five minutes of announcements, okay? So I know that everyone's excited for lunch. But don't forget that the longer you take coming back from lunch, the longer before we have cocktails. That's how that works. So you'll have to come back right after lunch. Okay, a um, couple things we wanted to do is I wanted to introduce, again, Konstantinos Karahalios. We have some very special guests that he wanted to mention, and then I'll come back up for a couple other quick things. Konstantinos. So this event is really initiated the whole effort by IEEE and uh, it is very important that the leadership of IEEE understands what we are doing, it is supportive. And uh, at the highest level, IEEE is governed by the board of directors and we are very lucky today because we have three persons who have been uh, in the board of directors and are still leading volunteers. You have seen two of them, Rob and Mike. There is a third one that I would like to invite to uh, say a few words. Uh, he's a very strong supporter of what we are doing. His name is Tov Kohlin, and he uh, has been also the president of one of the most important regions of IEEE, Region 6. And Tom, come here and tell us why are you supportive of what we are doing? Give us your... Uh, Thank you a lot. Uh, so Region 6, for those that don't know, uh, IEEE is divided into 10 regions. Region 6 is the Western United States, so I'm past director of that, and also past uh, president of IEEE USA. And I want to thank Stanford and the IEEE uh, Sustainable, people from the IEEE Sustainable Development Ad Hoc uh, for putting on this event. I think this is very, very interesting and a lot of it, good insights here. Just some quick comments I was thinking. Technology leverages the wisdom of science to magnify human impact. Technology enables scale. Technology allows us to evolve and respond to human needs at the micro and the macro level. Our decisions on where and how to apply technology can create new opportunities as well as new issues. And I'm pleased uh, to be contributing to discussions on how we can best apply technology to solving the world's outstanding challenges, including climate change. And just for information, I'm uh, writing about uh, data centers and ICT uh, for the Towns and Cities Committee. So if you've got any comments or uh, thoughts on that or any, any data you've got, I'd love to uh, see that. Thank you very much. Is it just me or does Tom have like the best radio voice ever? Seriously, Tom, you have an awesome voice. You are now the Planet Positive 2030 podcast host. No pressure. Um, seriously, what a beautiful voice. All right, we also have another guest uh, who's doing an amazing project. We wanted to get Amir up here, a dear friend. And then we just have one other quick announcement after Amir's gone. Amir, please come on up. Round of applause for Amir. Thank you, John. And what, what a wonderful morning today. Uh, I wanted to share a project with you. Uh, so my name is Amir Benifatimi. I'm an executive director at XPRIZE Foundation. And we're part of a group of partners, uh, including the World Economic Forum, actually, of course, many universities, to launch a global film project next year about our life in the future. And the goal is to capture visions of life in the future that will happen if what we are doing works. So our ask to you is the following, and we're going to come in different rooms that you are and ask you the following question. Imagine Planet Positive has happened. Our effort has been fru uh, fruitful, and we are in a good position by 2030. Can you imagine a life moment, a specific life moment, 10, 20 years after 2030, that you think 
measures a purpose for life for every human. We try to take your insightful inspirations and thoughts into video or in writing, so we have some inspirational elements when we when do the, the global launch. So we're going to be stopping by and asking you, if you want, to give us 10, 20 seconds of inspirational thought about, I think by 2045, mothers and daughters will talk about the environment together. I'm just making something up, but this is your idea about the future and how we are being closer to, na to nature, how life is going to be purposeful. So uh, we're going to come to your room and the magic world would be future life. And if you're willing to play the game, we're going to capture a video or your notes and gather them for the global launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. Um, chairs, moderators, scribes, go ahead and stand up again. We're going to applaud just because it keeps your blood going. Everyone in the room before lunch happens. Are you all still in the room? Did you all take off? Okay, good. You're here. Round of applause for these folks. Um, for anyone who is in any of the 10 rooms, if you are a moderator, a scribe, etc., and for any of our wonderful chairs, moderators, or scribes online, Again, I want to say a huge thank you to, to our amazing chief weaver named Mila Aliana and the other co-chair for our Human Wisdom and Culture Committee, Keisha. Um, they have worked very hard to create the videos and the content that will start all of your different committee sessions. We really want to honor our chief weaver and have you get connected to ancestors and the land. That said, moderators, chairs, and scribes, please check your emails and review what that process looks like because once lunch uh, 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 ends, we're gonna hit the ground running and play Mila's videos that she was kind enough to create. Thank you again, Mila. Uh, last thing I'll say is just for interest, along the lines, thank you, Gabrielle, for your beautiful comment. Uh, who here, if you're comfortable, if you're under 40, please stand if you're comfortable. I know it's an age question. You're under 40, that's great, all right. I'm already standing, so. And if you're under 30, anyone under 30, go ahead and stand. That is really good news. All right, anyone under 20? All right, okay. So all I can say is help us at our next couple of conferences to make the proportion that much larger, right? The people we're doing this program for are usually a lot younger than me. <laughs> I'm not telling you my age. All right, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful morning. Please be back in an hour, and we're gonna start the, the work that all of you are gonna help us do with Planet Positive 2030. Have a wonderful lunch. Round of applause for yourself.